being six o'clock, this meeting of the uh, Board of Selectmen is called to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is uh, accept, acceptance of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Purpose of this meeting is to, uh, after I guess close to three months of reading resumes and interviewing candidates, we, we feel very, very fortunate uh, that we have we feel we've come up with four outstanding individuals to be our finalists for town administrator here in Situate. And the purpose of tonight's meeting is to publicly interview those four candidates once again, uh, once again in public, I should say, uh, have them say a little bit about themselves to not only us, but now to the entire town, the, the cable TV and the people here tonight. There'll be approximately half hour interviews give or take, uh, whatever, a few minutes, whatever it takes. Uh, at the end, and this is Patricia, we'll probably <coughs> ask you to submit a list of references to Kim Donovan, and we have her email address here. Uh, and that's probably going to be the format, more or less, for the entire evening. So, so if you don't mind, again, welcome. We, we uh, had the pleasure of seeing you a few weeks ago, and and we welcome you back. Uh, we'll start off as we did a few weeks ago, and if you would just bring not only ourselves, but the rest of the town up to date on who you are and why you're here in Situate tonight, is the best way to put it. even though the job is ending, but um, I decided to apply for Situate in only one other position in the last six months um, because um, it was one that piqued my interest, one that uh, to Rick and the board and the town citizens credit I think is very well financed and managed in a conservative yet pro programmatic and thoughtful manner. I think it's a beautiful community and um, all the research that I've done and the folks I've talked to have only impressed me more and made me more uh, desirous of um, coming here. Good. Thank you. Thank you for bringing, bringing us all up to date. And, uh, the board itself has asked quite a few questions 
<laughs> in earlier interviews. Uh, we're going to try to synopsize, but you know, try to bring these all together so that we're not repeating the same questions, each one of us. But uh, uh, one of the first questions that came up last time, and it's here again tonight, and I'll start off with the board's permission, I'll, is, is the commute. We, we, we recognize the fact that, uh, would you explain once again how you intend to handle the, the fact that you, your family currently lives in South Hadley, am I correct? Conway, but... Conway, right next to, yeah, right up in the same area, where, well, you'll be working down here. So why don't you take, answer that if you could, first of sure, all. Sure, and I, I think that that's a, a, a valid, valid question and one that I think you need to have a comfortable answer and feel comfortable with my response. It's not my intent to drive back and forth from Conway every single day, which is uh, two hours and 45 minutes away as the uh, highways go. Um, but um, I do have a daughter that's a junior in high school. I have another daughter that's starting college in the fall. So my intent would be to relocate here um, on a rental basis <coughs> during the week, and then as soon as my daughter graduated from high school, my husband and I would move here. And as I mentioned, he's here today. And um, my intent really is to make my next job move my last job move. I have 25 years. I have a good 15 or 20 left. Um, I am impressed with the fact that Rick has been here 19 years, which is an incredible testament not only to the town and the boards he's worked with, but he himself. And um, that is something that I would like to see myself doing and making a long-term commitment to a community. It's something I think that we're also looking for. We, you know, we. We've seen communities that, for one reason or another, uh, have a new town administrator every two years, every year and a half, every three years, and overall it just doesn't seem to work very well. So we're, we are also looking for someone to, to be here for a long time, whatever that is. So. And we talked a little bit about that at my first interview, that often things take a long, long time, planning, preparation, research, review. Sometimes it has to go to town meeting two or three times till it's just right or funding's in place. So um, for me personally and professionally, I think you have to be in a place a while before you begin to even get to recognize the fruits of your labors um, because so much time these days goes into planning and before you can really get out of the gate and actually realize what you've started. Thank you. For the board, we'll open it up, whoever, no particular order, whoever would like to ask questions, jump right in. It was just, I, maybe you answered this the first time, but <clears throat> you had one other resume out there. Is that, is that currently or no? It's just we're the only... No, I applied for two positions. Um, my plan was January 1 to start thinking about my next move, knowing that the control board was jun June 30th. So I think on the same day, I applied for both Hopkinton and Situate. Um, I was a finalist in Hopkinton. That um, process concluded last March, this past March. This is the only other job I've applied for or have active. <coughs> so to, to go along with that, you mentioned that you have another opportunity in Springfield for a certain amount of time after June 30th. What is that? Is that still with the board? Um, no. Um, under the, the way the control board sunsets is that a new special act was play, uh, passed by the legislature to replace the control board special act. And that creates a chief administrative and financial officer position for the first time in, in Springfield. Um, there was a search for that, and um, it was discontinued. And a new search is ongoing, but since that person, as you know, these searches can take a while, the second search hasn't even started yet. So um, the mayor, by statute, is allowed to appoint an acting chief administrator and financial officer. My um, boss, the director of the control board, has been serving in that director of the control board and acting CAFO up until now. He will continue July 1 as just acting CAFO when the control board goes away and has asked me to stay on as the deputy. So, um, but again, that's, the statute is very clear that that's only until um, a permanent CAFO is hired. Thanks. Um, I know you're talking about the, the commitment, and, and again, I know that um, Mr. Norton had asked you the question, but I'm like, so you're confident that, you know, your, your, your intent is to remain here in situate for like the week? Is that what your intent is? And then to travel on the weekends back and forth? Okay. Or have them come here. Or have them come here. <laughs> okay. 
Um, because that's one of the major concerns I, I, that I know I have is, is, is the short term. I, it, like anything, things can sometimes appear not to be what they expect to be, and then the town of Situate would be put into position, which is not your intent or anybody else's intent of, um, shall we say, uh, of having to relook again in two to three years, which is uh, a major issue. Um, and the reason why I ask that is because I understand that your husband is committed to his position where he is, but I mean, you're, you're saying that after two years that you, you are prepared, if you were the applicant, if you were the town administrator, then to move here, and your husband is also committed to that? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it requires a leap of faith on both our parts. Correct. Correct. Um, many times during my career, people, I, when I worked in Long Meadow, it was 42 miles from Conway, and people were concerned about that. When I had two children that were under the age of four, that was a concern that I couldn't make the commitment. And um, not that you're going to go and talk to everybody I've worked with for 20 years. That has never been an issue in terms of my availability or commitment. We had a huge um, hazardous waste blaze in South Hadley two years ago where the 80 people needed to be evacuated. I never left in four days. Um, I was on scene within an hour and a half. Um, so again, you have m my commitment that, you know, if we have a relationship and it's ongoing and I want to make a commitment and you do, then part of that is, you know, not leaving every Friday or every other Friday. In that same vein, when you mentioned South Hadley, have you had experience with, like, the local emergency planning committee and setting it up, whether it was in uh, Long Meadow or anything along that lines? I mean, our town, we certainly have for, for emergencies, but I'm saying for for some type of pandemic or anything along that lines. Have you had experience uh, establishing that or being involved? Uh, yes. I know you wouldn't have it in Springfield because of your situation there, but what about the other communities? Yes, um, I did, and as you know, after 911, there became a lot more uh, mandates to communities in terms of the NIMS training and additional online training courses. So I really, um, one of my goals that year was to spearhead getting um, all staff trained in that. And I actually had, I went through three or four of those um, trainings. Um, and actually, one of them we had just completed before this hazardous waste incident in South Hadley. So when the board arrived on scene, it was really helpful because they had just all been updated on incident command. So instead of arriving at a scene where it was unfamiliar, um, they actually knew how the layout was, the public information officer, how all that would play out. So, um, yeah, um, I've had experience with that. Have you um, also, in your experience, um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm excluding S Springfield because situ uh, Springfield is a kind of, I think, a unique situation. Have you had experience with capital projects within the towns? And, and, and an example would be either a town hall, a school, or, or a senior center. And, and if you have, could you explain to us what kind of you know, involvement you've had in those regards? Construction. Construction, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, there's the capital plan and funding the capital plan. And then as far as actual construction, right before I left South Hadley, we had received an urban self-help grant for $400,000 to build a clubhouse at our golf course. So I was in the, on the planning stages for that. Um, up until that point, uh, as part of submitting the grant application, we already had to do full architectural design and review. Um, clearly, in Springfield, we're building a $125 million vocational technical school. And I've been involved. That was one of the things I was assigned to right when I went to Springfield because um, the school building authority regulations are completely new. The requirements and the hoops, as you know, to jump through are completely different now. So I've been the point person on making sure Chapter 149, the architectural requirements um, for uh, CMR at risk and those types of things. So I have had some experience in that. Um, transitioning to another area, I was curious, you know, um, clearly I, I, I would probably um, hypothesize that the town has, uh, within its departments, strong personalities, okay, various departments, um, and good personalities, I might add. Um, but if I were to ask you, what would your approach be to leading and coordinating a team that clearly would have, how do you approach that in your, your shall we say, your managerial s style? Uh, just to clarify, in terms of managing the staff? Or it's correct, the staff. Levels, not not the scale, the staff it, it specifically is what I'm referring. Um, well, I think it comes down to a matter of philosophy and how you approach your job, um, not only as a town administrator, but a manager of any organization of business. And that's really to use sort of a, 
uh, an analogy is, and you may have heard it before, is, is really um, the town administrator is the conductor of an orchestra or a symphony or a band. And you have all these different people who have different specialties and play different instruments. And it's really their job to coordinate them. I don't know what the appropriate gun is for your police department to have or the exact application of road salt to sand when it's snowing outside. That's the job of your department head. I think the role of the administrator is to help those folks be a better manager, a better administrator, help them think out of the box, stay within budget, or support their need to have more money or more staff based on valid evaluation and cost-benefit analysis. So I see my role really with other staff as a coach and someone that can help them do a better job in their subject expertise, whereas the manager on your behalf is really a jack of all trades that can ask the right questions, make sure that before it comes to the board, all the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, and the risks and assets of each thing are properly vetted. One last question in, in that same vein. I mean, um, obviously the economy is very tight. You've been in a situation with Springfield where you've had to address issues probably sooner than most communities in small towns. Um, but how do you go about upholding the morale, if you will, of, of, of the staff? the employees, so to speak, given those times. Certainly you've dealt with it in Springfield. Now, assuming you were the, the, the applicant for town administrator, how would you go about maintaining it given the, 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 the tight economy that we have with potential, you hear surrounding communities, and I'm not suggesting it with our town, but layoffs and furloughs and things along that line. How do you, if you were to be the TA, um, go about approaching that? Yeah, that's I mean, it's a very difficult question, and, and I really don't know if there's any easy answer or correct answer. Um, and I think, really, the bottom line is um, to be honest and tell what you know as soon as you know it. And even if it's not pleasant, I think the angst and anxiety that people experience not knowing or thinking that they hear something that might not be correct or is just floated as an idea and really is dismissed rather quickly is really, I think, the, you know, where things start to fall down. Um, most folks who work in local government know the lay of the land because an economic financial crisis happens in the Commonwealth about, it used to happen about every eight or nine years. Now it's happening every six or seven. So um, I think you have to engage in regular and frequent communication. You have to invite the unions in to tell them what you know about the financial situation and what your projections are, recognizing that it's a snapshot in time. You have to say you don't know if you don't know, but I think communication is the key. Um, morale is an a unfortunate result of what people, you know, a decline in morale, I think, is when people don't know, and that's manifesting itself in anxiety and other things. Um, we laid off 66 people in Springfield in March and April, um, and it was very, very difficult, but unlike the, four, um, I think, 350 that they did in 200, 2003, um, the communication was there, the projected budget deficit was there, the, we put up on the website suggestions, you know, what do you see in your department that could be helpful in terms of saving money? And it was amazing, um, the, the feedback that we got and things like that. So, um, again, um, it's very difficult no matter what the circumstance, and I think just com honest communication with staff all the way up the line. Um, I had the mayor draft an email to every single employee when we knew we were going to have to lay off folks. We didn't know who they were for a long time um, because he held some departments harmless, at least for FY09, public safety and education. Um, and more people appreciate receiving that email from him that just said, I don't know what's going to happen. This is a difficult time. I'll keep you posted. Let me know, you know, how you can help or any ideas. Um, and, and that's what we did. Thank you. Uh, Tony, Rick. Oh, a, a quick question. The last interview, we kind of went into details about finance. You have a very strong financial background. Obviously, you're the deputy of the Financial Control Board. Um, when you get a new job, you're always you have this energy and this and this ability to or this want to succeed and and my question to you is what one or two things have you learned over the past twenty something years that are going to be one of the first couple things you come in here and make sure that we're doing in terms of financial controls 
um, you know, you went, you were TA at one of these other towns, and you said, oh my God, you don't have a forecast, or oh my God, you don't have this control in place. Is there, is, and we may already be doing it, but what are one or two things that you found that you've, that have really helped you out in your prior jobs in terms of financial management? Well, a couple of things. I mean, at the outset, if, you know, I was starting tomorrow, what would I look at aside from wanting to chat with everybody and anybody? Um, you know, the department heads, the staff, and things like that to find out what their challenges and interests are. They're all right are. here. I know. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, because really they know, you know, what they want to do, what they can't do, what they're doing that they aren't doing well enough or could do better with additional resource. I would look at your management letters for the last five years from the auditor. I would see how much you had in stabilization and what your free cash certification was. I would look at your tax rate collection um, and your overlay reserve. That, that would just be for starters. I have a lot of that from looking at your um, town report from 2008. Um, but th those are, you know, I would look at um, monthly budget to um, revenue to, I mean, budget to expense for each budget and see departmental turnbacks and things like that. Um, so that's the first part of your question. The second part in terms of a long-term thing would be a lot of what you said you have in place already. Um, capital planning committee, you have a financial forecasting committee. Um, I would be particularly interested to see what financial policies you have in terms of use of the stabilization, use of capital, the policies around the funding of capital, uh, debt policy, debt schedule, those kinds of things. So I could really get a handle on your financial situation. Um, but as you noted, comparative to other communities, um, your community is, is doing fairly well in terms of the cuts because they've sort of may have planned to sort of expect this kind of result at some point in the future. South Hadley is in the exact same situation right now where um, these cuts that we're getting or anticipate getting from the legislature and the ones that we got on the 9th C haven't been, I think, as devastating to them as other communities. They didn't lay off anyone. And Springfield, uh, the control board went in with a $41 million deficit and we have, um, we just got a Moody's upgrade again. Uh, I think we have about 85 million in reserves right now for a 550 million dollar budget, so it's all comparable. Rick, Patricia, you've been a TA in Longmeadow for about seven years. <coughs> TA at Waitley for three or four years, I think, right? And South Hadley for um, you know seven and a half years as well. So you've got obviously a lot of experience, town administrators, three different communities. And although you're very enthusiastic about your job, and I, I was impressed by your earlier words about um, about um, you know long-term commitment and all that sort of stuff, and you clearly enjoy public service and you like working at the local level, um, which is important to me. However, with three different towns, we all, even though we love our jobs, there's certain aspects of our jobs that we don't like. And what aspect of being a town administrator is the part that you really don't enjoy? And I don't mean to make particular comments about any individual town, but just about the whole sort of gig, because you've done it now in three different towns, perhaps your fourth town with us. What is it that you think that you want to work on in terms of improving your own uh, capabilities as a TA, or what aspects of the job just, you know, kind of drive you nuts? And just in spirit of openness as a professor, I absolutely hate grading papers. If I never graded another paper as long as I lived, that would be fine. But I absolutely love my job. But there's that part that just, you know, makes me want to pull my fingernails out. Well, there's two. There's one that's personal, and I guess one that's more global. Um, ever since I started working in local government, I write the warrant for town meeting. So I can compose a warrant article at the drop of the hat. and like you with 54 Warren articles or 73. Um, that part is easy, but then when the Finance Committee made the change and then the Capital Planning Committee made a last minute change or the accountant said we had to revise that and you had the motions all ready to go and you're still, we had a representative town meeting in South Hadley, so our 150 page budget with our 20 page warrant went to every single member a month before town meeting. And so I was there collating, pasting numbers, 
and still wanting it to go to be copied and still there were changes to the warrant or the constable couldn't be found because he was in Florida. So, and that was okay for the annual town meeting. We sort of all took a sigh and did it, but then we'd have a special town meeting or an unexpected town meeting. So, um, so like grading papers, that was yeah. what I thought is, is the warrant, but um, it saved the town a lot of money on legal expense because I w was doing it. Um, the other, and this is a professional pet peeve I have is, um, and, and I don't want to generalize too much, but um, I care very much about what I do and um, the people that work for a community or the communities I served and the staff care very much about what they do. And I think many people are sort of of uh, the inference of the mentality that anybody who works in town hall got their job because they knew someone that worked there, and if they ever wanted to really do anything meaningful with their life, they would be someplace else. <coughs> and that's what I have a really particularly difficult time with. Um, I went to school to learn how to do this, um, and that's the difference, I think, from being selected versus elected. Um, and, to, and my interest in local government has always been to serve the elected person, because I want to be the person behind the scenes to make sure, you know, policy and stuff was really being based on informed decision making and, and well-researched things. And I don't think staff in, in the era of, of post two and a half, and, and citizens in general to the extent they should, realize that town employees, municipal employees, really have to be qualified now. They really have to have a skill set. Um, and also an, an innate desire of customer service, I think, that, you know, maybe you could phone it in 20 years ago, but you can't do that now. You need to have skills. There's usually not enough people on the staff, two people offices, three people offices, multitasking. So um, you need talented people. And I think um, we do a disservice when we realize that, you know, there's just not a bunch of people whose uncle was on the planning board and that's how they got their job. Oh. Um, we discussed some of this, you know, earlier, but I just kind of want to explore it again because it picks up on what you just articulated. Um, we are in, in public service, either elected or selected, and um, how do you go about constructing a welcoming attitude and maintaining a welcoming attitude in town hall to the citizens? I mean, you spoke about the 311 tracking citizen requests earlier, um, and that's a mechanical thing, and, I w and I'd be very interested in you elaborating on that and other mechanical things that you do, but also more sort of philosophically, um, given the fact that many people that come to town hall are coming there because they've got a problem with something, and so they're kind of fresh out of the gate. And some of them are um, well-intentioned but less informed about the realities of what they're trying to accomplish, and so how do you set up a mentality or an attitude throughout town hall to uh, to address that? Well, I think um, a couple of things. Um, one is I think um, folks need to be clear that it is a policy of the town that we um, embrace high customer service um, goals um, and, and that we strive to um, be helpful, informative, and uh, perform our service in the most professional and ethical way. Um, that being said, unlike the retail business or the private sector, the customer isn't always right on the municipal side. If your tax bill is 31 days due and it's 30 past due and it's 30 days in the month, it's past due and um, there's really not a lot I can do to help you on that. Um, so it is sometimes difficult, but that doesn't mean um, they shouldn't be treated with respect, that people who work for a community shouldn't always be cognizant of the fact that their salary is being paid by those folks. Um, so um, we do a lot of training around, I have in the past, on um, dealing with difficult customers, listening, um, being responsive, um, following up. Um, and, and, you know, some of the philosophy around the customer is the most important person is true. And when I hear people say, yes, but it gets in the way of all my other work, you know, that's really where we have to redirect back and say, well, that's our function, but our purpose is to, you know, provide a quality, you know, community where people want to live here and, and raise their children, I think. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rick. Uh, 
closing it on, I think we had 35 minutes or so allocated, not that we're trying to limit it to 35 minutes necessarily, uh, but there are a few housekeeping things they have to do. But if the board has any other questions, any members of the board, please feel free to continue with the with, with uh, the conversation. I'm okay. All set. If not, again, thank you for coming in. It was, it was great seeing you again, and, and thank you for being so open. Uh, just a couple of things I want to uh, finish up on, if I can, and, and it's very important, although it's not the most pleasant thing to talk about. The salary, I know you're somewhat familiar with the general area of our salary range, and knowing what you know, you you can live with that. That's in the ballpark. There'll be some negotiations, of course, with whoever is chosen, and we'll try to draw, draw up a, a, some sort of a contract for the individual to look at and make sure everyone's on the same page. But the salary that's offered now is acceptable to you, give or take. Um, and I don't mean any disrespect, but yep. I'd be happy to have that discussion if I'm offered the position. But Absolutely. In open session at yep. this time, I think yep. it would be premature for any of us okay. to get into detail. That's fine. Further questions? We have uh, Kim's uh, email address. I'll give it to you. Maybe you could email her with uh, two or three references that we might want to check. We're going to ask this of all the candidates. And are there any particular uh, communities or no. work that you want the references from? I can just choose. Whether you feel comfortable. I would say to the board, agree with that? Yeah. Why don't we try and get more than two or three? How many? Well, want to get one for each of us? Five. five. Four or five? Four or five? That's yeah. fine. Yeah. That's fine. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. That's, That's it. it. Any questions uh, for us? too bad, yeah. was it? Any questions for us? July? Around July, as we get into June, that month that we were looking for a lead time uh, well, goes further into July a little bit. But with Patricia's situation, you know, she has to find a, a home or something like that. Yeah. Is that she's well, going to have me, a little. Let me speak to that. Um, yep. I spoke with Rick about. I spoke with Rick yesterday, actually, and uh, about the position and. Um, and I, I should share with you, I was in Pittsfield having breakfast last Friday, and I was reading the town report, way the heck the other, and, and some man came up to me, he was staring at me the whole time, and he said, do you live in Situate? And I was like, no, I've applied for a job there, and he said, oh, I love Situate. He said, I used to work there, I used to ride my bike, and I thought, well, there's a sign. <laughs> It's a great place. I have family in the area. Um, my brother lives here, my sister-in-law. Um, so there's no impediment for me to start, at least on a part-time basis. So m my lodging or where my head goes at night shouldn't really be any concern to the board because I have a place to stay till okay. I find someone. So um, thank you for your concern, but it's really not an issue. So you have family that lives in Situate? I, not in Situate, but in, in on the, the South general Shore, vicinity. so less okay. than an hour. So, yeah, okay, um, great. That would, and um, my brother and I used to get along, so I think <laughs> we're still... <laughs> yeah, wait till, yeah. wait till you're living with him again. He's a bachelor, so I'm good there. I want to be taking the kid's bedroom or anything like that. <laughs> great. Thank you again thank you. so much for coming in. Thanks. Thank you, Patricia. It was nice to see you again. Nice seeing you. Take a two-second two break. I wonder if we can leave those doors open. I know it's... Push those mics back a little, too, and get comfortable. I think... Uh, it seems like the previous person might have been slightly taller. Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you for coming in. We're going to let the uh, uh, cable guru tell us if that air conditioner is too loud for the sound. No, we're okay. We're okay, so it, it did get a little warm in here uh, during the last half hour, so we'll try to keep that on. Again, welcome welcome back to Situate. We, we certainly appreciate uh, the fact that you were able to make it back tonight, and, and, and congratulations on making it to the to the to the finals. Uh, as I said earlier, we had a very very uh, great bunch of applicants, and, and it's a credit to the people who <coughs> who were here tonight uh, to finish where they finish. <coughs> what I'm going to do is, as we did in our preliminary interviews, ask you to say a, a few words about yourself, more or less what brought you here tonight. Uh, 
not so much for ourselves because you were kind enough to share that with us last time, but with the people here tonight and, and, and the cable TV audience. So if, following that, we'll ask a few questions, and that should be it. So thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Andrew Mailer, uh, 46 years old, married father of uh, three daughters, school-aged daughters. Uh, by next September, two of those uh, daughters will be in high school, which is great. Uh, I think I'm looking forward to the day they drive, but I haven't quite determined if that's the case or not. I guess I'll figure that out in a couple of years or so. Um, I want to thank you folks for inviting me back. I know that the process is, is difficult, and it's difficult really for two reasons. One is to find the person you think has the qualifications to do the job, of which my guess is there, there's certainly more than one, uh, more than myself, uh, but then try to match that up with what the town needs and, and do that all in the context of replacing someone who has a remarkable tenure in a community. Uh, I, I don't uh, ever expect that I'll be on a board of selectmen, I think. I'm not sure that that's uh, an aspiration of mine, certainly. Uh, but I would expect making that decision and hoping that you're not back in this room one, two, or three years from now is one of those things that are, you know, weighs heavy on making this decision. So I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Um, I don't apply uh, for jobs lightly. I certainly haven't applied for this job lightly. Uh, it's important. Uh, what brings me to situate um, was a decision to evaluate the community and decide whether it made sense for me, just like you have to make your decision of whether it makes sense for you, I have to make that same decision myself. The stability in situate, the tenure and the life of the charter, I think the charter was passed approximately 33 years ago, and certainly the tenure of Mr. Agnew uh, meant a lot uh, to me in terms of applying for the position. Certainly having driven around the, driven around the community over the last couple of weeks, uh, took off last Friday to drive down here during my sort of normal commute time, understand what that's like, uh, spending some time with my family, talking to my wife about it, and really evaluating what is the benefit of Situate, which is a stable community with a commitment in its own resources, both natural and human resources, and a place that people reflect on in a very positive way. Um, that's what brings me to Situate, an opportunity to take what I know, my experiences, and apply it in a place that I know is committed to be a great place to live, that values quality of life, and that sees itself as a stable and forward-looking community. So that's that's what brings me here tonight. Thank you. That's very, very, very well. Uh, the question that was asked in, in the earlier interviews of you and other candidates, and since it is somewhat of a isolated community when it comes to commuting, uh, you live on the I wouldn't I guess the North Shore for. Uh, in, a, in, in all honesty, it's a bit of a commute. <laughs> There's no question about that. Uh, and it is uh, somewhat of a concern uh, to me. How, how would you handle it? You, I know you've commuted. You say you did it last Friday. That's great. What have you found? Is it, is it a doable doable commute, I guess? Uh, what I committed to the board in the preliminary interview, the short answer is yes. Um, what I committed to the board in the preliminary interview is that uh, I'm not going to either place you or I in a spot where I'm going to take a position or be offered a position that I don't feel I can get to. Uh, this is not a 9-to-5 job, nor is it an 8.30 to 4.30 job. There's requirements in this position that don't exist in others, and quite frankly, there's a lot of professional people who work in this community. Their jobs are not 9-to-5 as well. Uh, commute is one factor to be considered relative to the position. I'm comfortable and committed. I can get here and spend the appropriate amount of time here, which is certainly beyond the regular workday. I understand there are public events. It's commonplace for me during snow emergencies to understand what's happening in our community, drive along beside, you know, with uh, those people and for instance in snow removal operations so that I understand what's happening in the community. It's common for me during uh, other natural disasters as an example, certainly water disasters having worked in a community that's along uh, the Atlantic Ocean, sometimes those storms creep up, to understand what's happening in that. Uh, when I make an investment to work in a place, it's an investment. It's not, it's not here to just show up to town hall when it's open and leave when it's closed. Uh, and, and quite frankly, uh, regardless of the commute, which, which has timed out pretty regularly at about a 55 minutes today, yeah, a little longer than that with the traffic, but this isn't my commute today normally. Uh, I am perfectly comfortable that I can do the requirements of this job, make the commute, and again, if I didn't sit across my wife and, and get her opinion as well, and get the commitment that she understands what that all means and what it means to our family, I would not be here. Thank you. Uh, to the board, anyone want to start off with? <coughs> Andrew. Joe, or some Joe contacted you to say you were going to be a finalist, and did you tell this, you know, people at Swan Scott, and, and and how did they take that? Being in that position once before was quite a shock, and I just, 
you know, you're one of our finalists, and uh, they're gonna, you know, there'll be big shoes to fill if you if you leave there. I'm sure. So, I, what was their reaction, if you don't mind me asking? I, yeah, I think to put things in context, and I and I certainly mentioned this in, in the first interview. Uh, I'm in my seventh year in Swampscott. Uh, I'm the first town administrator in Swampscott. Um, uh, I was offered a five-year extension back a little over two years ago. Uh, at that time, uh, I indicated that I, I didn't want the five-year extension. I didn't mean that in any disrespectful fashion. I think the Swampscott experience has been great. Uh, felt that being the first person in the door, uh, a, a lot of how I was viewed as being that first person as a change agent, really saw myself as a uh, person with more experiences than that. And so I communicated very openly with my board at the time that instead I'd prefer a two-year extension so that nearing the end of that, I could start to explore other opportunities. Uh, they've been aware if I've applied for a position, I communicate with them first, my wife first, the board of selectmen second, yeah. typically in that order. Uh, they're aware of it. I, I apprise them of the status of that. They're certainly aware that I'm here this evening. Uh, from their perspective, uh, I, I certainly think that they would be disappointed, but they're, they're, they're aware of my circumstance. I'm fortunate enough to have a current contract. Uh, I haven't asked for a renewal. They've approached me about of three and five year extensions, did so again this week. And again, I think what's important is that the dialogue between a board of selectmen, a community, and a town administrator be open and honest. And what I've said to them is, I can sign a three year contract and then to go decide to leave a year from now, but that's not an honest dialogue with the board of selectmen. So I've indicated to them that I continue to look at opportunities. I've told them that if I'm fortunate enough to be offered the situate position, I want to accept the situate position. And uh, they recognize what's ahead of them in terms of a search process, but they also appreciate the candor I've had with them. Thank you. Can I piggyback on that for one yeah, second? Absolutely. Can you just elaborate on why do you, what's happening in Swampscott that makes you want to leave? Yeah, Swampscott is, is a good job experience, and I certainly don't want to leave the impression that it's not. I, I think from my perspective, I feel like I'm in the middle of my career having a whole bunch of experiences that I want to apply in a place uh, that's sort of at the same point that I am. Sometimes when you take a position, certainly as the first person in the door, there's a lot of change. It was a 51-49 vote, 52-48 vote to change the charter. It was a lot of systemic change that needed to, to happen upon my arrival. Some really interesting things that were learning experiences, rebuilding of relationships that folks saw as broken trust when they went from elected positions to appointed positions. And I feel, certain, I've always said that I believe the person needs to fit the community and the position at the time it happens. Uh, I believe to a certain extent I'm still viewed as that change person, even though I'm not, even though I've built those bridges and built those relationships, because I was the first person in the door. I think it's the right thing for Swampscott and the right thing for me to have another person sit in that seat. I'm, I'm confident enough that they will find a very qualified person, and I'm confident enough in my own skills I'll find what makes sense for me. Uh, the stability here, the long tenure of Mr. Agnew, the length and age of the charter, the fact that it's sort of been vetted through, you know what you expect, you know what you're looking for in terms of a community, that makes a lot of sense to me. And from my perspective, for Swampscott, having someone come in who won't be the first anymore, they'll be continuing on the legacy of, that's, that's happened in Swampscott in the last seven years. You've, you've mentioned the charter a couple of times. Sure. Can you tell me what you feel is the strength of our charter and where it differs from the one in Swampscott? Or what, what attracts you to ours as opposed to? Well, charters are, are remarkably personal documents. And there certainly isn't a standard, uh, you know, Massachusetts is a parochial place, so we, we certainly take that to heart in local communities. Uh, you know, strength here is that there's a fair amount of, uh, a reasonable amount of authority within the town administrator position, meaning obligation from the appointment perspective, not the accountant and not the, uh, the treasurer collector, but certainly from some of the other appointment, re you know, re setups. That doesn't exist in every charter, as an example. Certainly there's a 15-day sort of refusal or overturn period, but overall the, the involvement from that regard, from the capital improvements perspective, the involvement of many of the department heads along with the town administrator and the capital improvements uh, function. So a lot of those uh, administrative or operational pieces provide the tools to the town administrator to effectively do their job. Doesn't mean it dismisses the relationship with the Board of Selectmen at all, but I think that's a strength of your charter. And again, the length and tenure of your charter. Uh, we passed the charter in Swanscott seven years ago. That's somewhere in the vicinity of 26, 27 years later than Situate did. And, and, and charters have the tendency to sort of evolve in terms of how they're applied. So I think that that's a strength. The differences are actually not there are not that many dramatic differences. I talked in the preliminary interview that the budget that gets submitted to the Board of Selectmen uh, by the town administrator in Swampscott includes school funding and then goes through the process of finance committee, what you call the advisory committee, and, and sort of travels down that road. So there's some similarities that way. In terms of appointments, 
Uh, the selectman cannot appoint anyone I don't recommend, but there is no direct appointment of the board of selectmen like you have the treasurer, collector, or the accountant. So I don't make the appointment and wait for a refusal. I have to make a recommendation, and the selectmen have to support that. Not unlike I think the history has been here, from at least best I can tell, the selectmen typically, you know, we, we have a dialogue about that. I understand where the selectmen stand, and so those appointments are, are have universally been um, supported. So there's a lot of similarities and some and some subtle differences, quite frankly, like the appointment of the treasurer collector in the account. I think uh, what do you find, and you may have touched on this, uh, and I always have the greatest amount of sympathy, I guess, for the first town administrator in any any town. It's it's you, you go into a town and dealing with people who are been used to doing things sure. completely different. And here now we have a, a boss or someone in charge. Mm -hmm. What were the problems that you found in, in Swampscott uh, being the first that you don't think you would see here, for example? Well, I'll give you, some of them sound a little mundane, but they're, they're uh, I think someday they'll be the uh, baseline for a book. This is, we're sort of yeah. interesting yeah. stuff. <laughs> and um, I'll use some of the examples in the preliminary, but let me give you a whole bunch of small ones because I think they're helpful. The, the, Entering into Swampscott, there's a not the standard Mass Highway sign. There was a there, as I as I would go into Swampscott, and you know, at any number of times, there was this frame, say a five by five frame that said entering Swampscott, but there was nothing in the frame. And so I would travel into Swampscott, and there was nothing in the frame. And there was and, and so uh, when I was fortunate enough to be appointed, I said, "When's the sign arriving?" It clearly looked like it was going to hold some something special because it wasn't your traditional Mass Highway sign. There was plantings around it, um, and they said, "Well." we're not quite sure we've been you know talking about this and dealing with this and this person said they'd do it and and I said well how long has the dialogue been going on and they said two years <laughs> and, and so um, I use as an example that sometimes uh, a different person's view on things someone else coming to the table and saying okay uh, let's bring those parties that said they're going to contribute the sign or make the sign to the table add some others uh, to the to the mix who may have an interest in um, Swampscott has a tremendous gateway. It's the Atlantic Ocean, not unlike the benefit you folks have here. But as you approach Town Hall and come into Swampscott, it is on the ocean. It's fantastic. And so this is the first thing you see, you know, the empty sign. And it is, it's interestingly symbolic, you know, quite frankly, about a lot of things happening. So uh, couldn't get those parties together, involved uh, the, uh, the high school art program. And within a couple of months, we had high school students creating a wonderful tile mosaic uh, on five by five size that they installed and it sits there seven years later. And it is what people stop and look at because it shows small monuments of around the community and it's a neat little feature. Uh, second, and these are really sort of micro issues, but I think really the kind of things you deal with during the transitions. Um, in almost each and every department, the board and commission which ran that department signed their department head to a contract. The state statute limits the amount of people that can have, that are, uh, that can allow contracts, employment contracts in municipal government. But, but each and every department head got a brand new contract with remarkable length, right? Because the, the expectation is someone's going to come in and we're just going to you know, clear house, which, which isn't the case. I take great pride in the fact that many of the folks who, who were there when I started are there today and thrive. But it was an interesting little subtlety. And I had to sort of talk them off that and talk about the fact that this, this isn't about some kind of um, implosion and recreation. It's about uh, making sure there's some centralized reporting authority. Finally, I'll give you another two more small ones. I apologize, but they're, they're always interesting stories to me. I gave you the one in the preliminary interview about the fact that uh, there was um, signs, and not unlike uh, town hall business signs here, but each and every department head and almost everybody else had a personal parking spot and sign. And and uh, although I appreciate that, parking was not that contentious in Swampscott. We didn't need the personal sign. And so what I talked to the department heads about, and others in the selectmen were fantastic about it. They all had individual signs. Um, was about the fact that, that maybe we should make the parking lot look like a sort of generic parking lot for everybody to use. Because we have a post office next door, some people use that, there's a library out back. And, and uh, they supported the fact that we, we needed to stop being somewhat proprietary about how we viewed ourselves, and that we were one group. We weren't a bunch of individual groups, we were one group. And finally, um, for whatever interesting reason, we had four different telephone systems in town hall. Now, those four could not, the, those four could not communicate with one another. So if you got a call in the building department, you could not transfer that call to the Board of Health. But the Board of Health had funded their system, and the building department had funded their system, and they just didn't talk before they purchased the systems and they couldn't communicate. So we had a lot of communication that was, um, can you please call this other number? And, and um, 
a huge emphasis of mine is relationships, partnerships, and communication. And you cannot communicate if you can't simply transfer the call to someone else. And so um, it required a capital investment. It required town meeting to support it. It was not hugely expensive. But we, in, within uh, several months approaching a town meeting, got a single phone system where people can communicate. Believe it or not, police and fire can now communicate with three-digit dialing to the other town departments as well, so we're not occupying outside lines. And so it was, it was all those little things that made a, a really great place less than perfectly functional because they were always bumping into one another. One, one question before I, uh, while I think of it, I guess. Like every town, there's a, there's a school uh, system, school department, town side of government. We pride ourselves here in Situate uh, uh, for having been able to work very well together. Uh, we had some bumps in the road as we go along, as I'm sure, every town. But we, we are very, very conscious on, on our side of the concerns and the, and the problems that the school department faces, mostly financially uh, with their budgets. How important is that to you, and what, and what can you say about your thoughts on town-school relationships, if I can put it that way? Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's always amazing. When I, first, I, I spent the first uh, third of my career in the private sector, so as I, as I entered the public sector, I'm in a situation where there was not great relationships, school and town, um, I, I never really understood that. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's our budget, it's our budget. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, it's the town of situate budget, it's the town of situate school depart department, but I know that's not how it works here, but, but that was sort of the nature of the dialogue. Uh, I can tell you that uh, in the top ten things, beyond my little stories about changes in town hall, uh, the top ten things that I view as successes in Swampscott is, is the relationship between the board of selectmen uh, the school committee superintendent and I. Superintendent and I speak once, twice, three times a week. He's a remarkably committed um, gentleman who's a fantastic superintendent. Uh, he's invested in the concept that we have to know what each other is doing. We have to partner on things. We regularly partner on any number of things. We're talking about removing a portable school structure that was added some years ago. We're talking about how to work together to remove that. We had conversations today. Um, it's essential to what you do. There is no, there's not two different budgets in town. It's one budget. And ultimately, we're all sort of quasi competing for those services, and all those interests seem to, to clash. But if there's, a, if there's a healthy relationship there, then they understand, the school department certainly understands what you have to go through, and the town administrator and the superintendent understands that as well. I do understand you're transitioning to a new superintendent. I think it's a good opportunity to begin that relationship early. Uh, I believe in, in regular, casual meetings with my superintendent. I come up, I bring him a cup of coffee. He brings me a cup of coffee. We talk about things on occasion. You know, we disagree. We certainly have our moments of disagreement. But by developing not just a professional relationship, but, but a relationship where he doesn't think I'm out trying to get the last couple of dollars out of his budget, um, it makes sure that when we get into really difficult circumstances, uh, we do things better than we would otherwise. L let me add one piece of this, which is Swampscott may not be situate. Um, that relationship, school and town, has led to a better relationship with our finance committee, your advisory committee. The fact that, they, that, the, that the, the finance committee, in our case, understands that we relate, helps us all sit in the room and talk about the budget as a total sum, rather than breaking down the budget into smaller segments. It's been really helpful. Thank you. I, you know, <clears throat> Mr. Mailer, again, welcome. Um, what kind of experience have you had with establishing in the past I know that you've been past 16 years between Winthrop, Chelsea, and also uh, Swampscott, but what kind of um, um, involvement have you had with local emergency planning committees within those towns? Uh, in, in Chelsea, we had a pretty active uh, LEPC. Uh, it was something that was Mystic Valley LEPC, very involved, uh, primarily driven, quite frankly, the emergency management director in Chelsea is a full-time employee, believe it or not. Uh, the this, this situations and issues in Chelsea certainly were different. Uh, I was acting uh, city manager at the time of 9-11. I can tell you the issues that we faced. Um, uh, I, I partnered with the mayor of the city of Boston to oppose the LNG tanker entering um, the Charles River. It was a contentious time. We had over 60 calls uh, of threats of anthrax in the city of Chelsea during my time there post 9-11. Uh, the, the, the coordination of regional LAPCs, uh, central areas for emergency dispatch uh, were essential. Uh, so I would certainly say I had more focus during that time. Um, the relationship on the North Shore is slightly different. Uh, it's a little more autonomous. We have uh, good emergency communication, excuse me, a coordination on a health department level with a developed uh, real plans for how to uh, address emergency issues. 
Uh, we certainly work with NEMLEC and those agencies to make sure that we communicate well. There's a, an aggressive discussion on the North Shore about a regional uh, emergency communication center that will also work as a, uh, uh, not only a dispatch area, but an emergency communication backup area, really compelled by uh, the explosion in Danvers a couple of years ago where Danvers, which has a very sophisticated and uh, a uh, positive dispatch was overwhelmed by the number of calls that came up at the explosion in Denver. So uh, emergency communication is important to me. Um, support regionally is essential, our ability to communicate. It still stuns me, quite frankly, that we don't have interoperability at a level that we really should. Our ability to communicate UHF to VHF is not w what it should be uh, statewide. And I think the state is making a commitment to that within 911 charge and telephone bills by, by focusing on interoperability but it isn't quite yet what you and I would want in the case of an emergency. So I've had a pretty su substantial experience in that. What about with um, like capital buildings or buildings of fuel structures? And, sure. and in particular, I draw your attention to like whether it's a town hall or whether it's a school or, or for that matter, a senior center. What kind of experience have you had in the past 16 years? Right. Uh, I've served on the school building committee of the town of Swampscott. We built a high school, uh, the first new school building in, in nearly 40 years in the town of Swampscott. Uh, the creative part of that with a whole bunch of really creative people sitting in a room. We decided to add to the back of the Swampscott High School a brand new senior center. We combined a senior center in the high school. Uh, first time it's happened uh, as we're aware of it in the nation. That's been a remarkable partnership. The seniors have their own segregated space, can leave a joint area when school's not in session, use walking tracks and, and other resources that are available in a really magnificent high school structure. Served on the school building committee for that project for years. Uh, we've just completed an historic reconstruction and expansion of uh, Town Hall in Swampscott. Funded, the design was funded by Mass Historical Commission. Uh, we have a significant amount of historical structures in Swampscott. They're important to what we do. They're the essence of who Swampscott is, quite frankly. Um, yeah, I, I certainly would tell you that Swampscott Town Hall is today uh, one of the top 10% of, of facilities. It is a former, it was a house of one of the co-discoverers of electricity, and not only today functions as his former home and historical monument, but functions as a, an, oper an operable town hall, which is sort of neat. I served as a director overseeing uh, the tail end of the Chelsea Schools project, which is at the time the largest uh, investment the state had made in public schools. Uh, they built every new school in Chelsea. Every school was either taken down, sold, uh, and replaced with a brand new facility post receivership. At the tail end of the project during my time as deputy city, city manager, I served as the, um, the project manager overseeing those projects. Um, in total, I've been involved with nearly a half a billion dollars in public construction projects, and um, which I find really interesting, by the way. Uh, I love public construction. I, I don't like the bidding process necessarily. I don't like uh, how it's limited, and I think some ways it costs the community too much money. But in terms of watching something grow for nothing, from nothing, I think it's substantial. Uh, finally, the, the current talk um, recommended and supported by me is to begin the design phase for a new police station in Swampscott. I'm not sure ultimately we'll get the full funding for that. It'll be about $7 million. Uh, but it is, it is the last substantial structure that needs investment in, in Swampscott. How do you, just transitioning over to um, your, your management style, um, how do you go about dealing with potential strong personalities for department heads and, and trying to coordinate and trying to, um, um, you know, approach those issues as a as a town manager or a town administrator correct me um, it's fine a big duly difference. noted <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know it, I, I wish I could tell you this one sort of magic or road answer uh, in, in the end of the day y you have to understand that everybody is different uh, there are some folks who will not come to you with issues that maybe they should and there are some folks who will come to you with issues that maybe they shouldn't and every person is different um, Part of the challenge of every town administrator is understanding that all you are different and, and my relationships with you will be different, maybe not from an inequity point of view, but everybody communicates differently. So you have to be flexible enough to understand that the way everybody approaches their own work life and their relationship with one another um, is different. That being said, uh, meeting regularly with department heads and staff is important because that's when you can see some of the interrelationships. Sometimes there, there can be a um, fundamental flaw in my business that we stay in our room and we think everything is working below us because we see work product and what's brewing underneath is that maybe interdepartmentally there's not great relationships and it's impeding things from happening properly. Let's say a building inspector is not communicating well with an assistant assessor. We're not getting the building department data into the assessing office to establish new growth. 
We don't know that mess. If we're sitting, sitting too high up, not paying attention to what's happening, not communicating on a daily basis with those departments, we miss some of those things which are important. Uh, I'm, as I've expressed in the past, I'm visible. I go into departments. I certainly don't micromanage. I talk to them. I ask what's happening. Anything happening today? Any issues going on? Anything I can help with? I think by establishing those individual one-on-one -on -one relationships, um, it helps me understand when there are differences between departments or when there's maybe an issue brewing between um, what I may have said and how they interpreted. So uh, communication is essential and not just every other week at a department heads meeting, but visiting departments. And I do that on a very regular basis to make sure I understand the issues that are out there. Building off that, if you know, given the current economic situation and, and as I as you know, I mean, there's some towns who are laying off and the furloughs, and, and I'm not sure exactly what Swamp, Swamp, Swamp Scott's doing, but um, how do you go about addressing the morale? I mean, we've got obviously employees who are probably thinking, what's going to happen next? I mean, you're coming in, assuming you're the person, whoever's going to be the next town administrator is going to come into a very tight fiscal situation, and um, presumably it's going to get bleaker than it's before it gets better. How do you deal with the morale for the employees? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, first of all, I know that all your contracts, I think, are due to expire this June 30th. So yes. there's, there's that sort of interesting play of unions deciding whether or not they really want to be at the table right now and management deciding if they want to be at the table with unions. It, it's, it's a fairly complex time. Um, I, I certainly would say to you that uh, one thing, it, this is it's related but probably not direct to your question, this is the most difficult time to deal with employee morale, period, that I have experienced in you know, quarter century worth of uh, work and certainly 16 years in municipal government. Cause, because between what we see in terms of the financial constraints, combined with the general tone of not just talk radio, but generally the media on issues of, you know, uh, whether or not municipal employees or state employees are doing what they're supposed to because of the fiscal constraints, there certainly is a feeling amongst employees that they are the ones being focused on. Um, it, it's a reassurance thing and it doesn't always work. Um, the reality is that I support the employees that work for us and for the town. Um, I support, it doesn't mean that everything, every action they take, I support, but they have to know that the position of town administrator is managing what they do, but they enjoy the support of that position as well. And, and it's not always enough. Um, it's not always enough to get through contentious negotiations to enjoy the support, but you've got to repeat it. You've got to compliment when things go well. You, ha you can't always uh, sort of a little bit carrot and stick. Can't always be, geez, you didn't do this well today and not bring up the fact that maybe things went well on another front. So ne they need to receive the reassurance that they know that I support what they do. I'm an advocate for municipal workers. I think they do a good job. I think often that they get criticized for things that are not um, what they should get criticized for. At the same time, we have expectations and goals. And, and you need to remember to compliment when things go well because there are times when you need to criticize when they don't. One last question. I got to take another bite at this apple. Um, I know you talk about the travel and the distance, and I know that you mentioned about 55 minutes coming down. But I kind of envision the um, the November day or the December, January, February day where it's dark outside, commutes a nightmare, all the routes are backed up because of accidents, and you're you're coming down, um, which I think could be a very long commute. Let alone if there's a snowstorm. Um, you know, um, obviously, as a duty, the duties of the town administrator are trying to figure out, you know, what to do for the town. And, and what concerns me is is that uh, is that commute is going to be. I know that you said that you'd commit, you you wouldn't have applied at this situation, but that's one of the the major holds holdups I have is is that that's a long commute. The last thing I'd like to see is a situation where, you know, given the family and obviously you're going to be sacrificing, I assume, I would, I think any town administrator who's going to be commuting that long is going to be making sacrifices for the benefit of the town because that's the position of the job given the distance. And, um, you know, um, in all fairness, are, are you prepared then to say that that's the sacrifice that you're prepared to make for this town? Yes. Uh, but let me add to that. If I didn't give you the answer up front, I would feel like I'm sort of deceiving. I'm not saying you're obfuscating. I'm not saying you're, no, no, you're, you're, no. you're circling no, that. I'm just saying that. that, you know, it's being asked because yeah. it's, a, it's a major drive. And, and I'm like, if I had the snow and the travel and the backup and the accidents, sure. I mean, maybe the first week I'd say fine and it goes away. But then after like three or four months of it, I'd finally say, you know what, it's nice, it's a beautiful town, but, you know, I've got my family up here and, you know what, it's just... It's just it's wearing me down, given given yeah. my commitments to what I've said I was going to do, sure. and that's what I'm concerned about. And I think I, know I think that. we all are, but I'm just saying <laughs> yeah. it's obviously um, I raise your hand. And I and I certainly appreciate that. I, I can't um, I, I can't give you information that makes that go away. 
and, and I know that because we've had this discussion and it's clear I can't, right? But what I can say to you is, like every other professional job, there is a commitment requirement. I talked to someone today who happens to work in Beverly, Massachusetts and travels from Randolph. That's a much more difficult commute than I. I happen to talk to the town administrator in Duxbury who travels a heck of a long more distance than I to get to Duxbury every day. And that is a sacrifice. Um, but it's a sacrifice that I've chosen to make. And all I can say to you is this. Um, this is not an interim step for me. There are no guarantees in life. Um, you can pick any one of the four people before you, and, and just for the sake of saying it, any one of those or the one you select may say, I'm moving to situate tomorrow. And you feel really good, and you select that candidate, and that's your choice. And in the end of the day, it does not guarantee that person will be here next year or the year after. We all make sacrifices to do what we need to do. I appreciate the fact that you see my sacrifices as different, but that's, those are sacrifices that I've chosen to make, and I would not be here if I wasn't willing to make those sacrifices. And I'm not taking this position as a trial, as a way of saying one year from now, boy, this was not, you know, uh, I would be more than happy to provide you with either uh, my call-outs for sick, of which there's none in 24 years, or uh, my track record relative to what happens to me during snow removal you know, operations or you know, times of, of inclement weather, of which we know those arise when we don't expect them to. Uh, I drive a, a car that consumes way too much gas so that I can get where I need to be when I need to be there. And that requires sacrifice. But the same, in some ways, and you may see it as different, is the sacrifice when after eight years I left the private sector where my name may never appear in the paper. And for 16 years, my name has. And, and um, I, I'm not sure which one's worse, quite frankly. I think it's a little bit of a challenge. I personally, if you could trade me uh, the commute that I have to take this job with the ability not to have my name appear in the paper, I'll take the latter, hands down, uh, even if some of that stuff is good stuff. Right? It's one of those things I don't get used to. Uh, I am not taking this job as a transition. I will do the job. Does it guarantee I will be here for 18 years? It does not. But no one can make that promise. And they do, quite frankly, to not being honest with you. I'm making the commitment that this job will not be altered by the length of my career, uh, commute. It will not be changed. My decision to go somewhere else, if it's 10 years from now or 15 years from now or uh, 64 is 18 years from now, um, will be based on decisions that are other decisions in my life, but not based on the fact that I decided to take a position which complicated my life. I'm here. It's already complicating my life in the sense that I've made that decision. And that's it's the best way I can articulate it to you. And, and I understand your concern. And if I'm in your spot, I understand the concern as well. But I'm hoping you look at who I am this wide and not just on that issue. Uh, Sean, Rick, you want to have anything else? Yeah. Rick? Yeah. Um, when you were last year, primarily through questioning from the other folks, sure. um, there's a lot of discussion about the finances and, and nuts and bolts and all that sort of stuff. But different than that, um, from your perspective as town administrator and, and um, taking a look at where the state is right now, how long do you think we're going to be in uh, tough financial straits? What are some of the things you are going to want to be keeping an eye on in terms of state aid? How do you plan on dealing with that um, in, the in the future? And, and, and primarily, you know, GM went belly up today and all this sort of stuff. Everybody said that was good news. I was trying to trying to catch yeah, the silver lining. Trying to that. find that one. Yeah. Maybe it was the stock market bump that happened yeah. with it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's uh, boy. Yeah, that's as I talk a lot. That's probably I could give you an hour answer, but I won't. I'll try to limit yeah. the answer to about a minute and a half. Uh, I don't expect that the state the state has been unable to find bottom on their own revenue stream, and I expect that to continue for some length of time. Um, that's part of the problem, really, the unrest. This has been uh, the most unusual. I guess I'm being somewhat complimentary, a budgetary season that the, our state legislatures ever had to experience, and that is because uh, they don't all agree about the revenue estimate, and that's, in essence, what drives the budget. Right. Budgets are revenue-driven. Right. Uh, municipal governments are revenue-driven. You only can spend up to what you have in terms of revenue. The expenditures are typically fairly tight. So they continue to struggle with what they believe is the appropriate revenue estimate. If you understand um, some stuff about uh, some stuff, that sounds really great. If you understand some things about uh, capital gains tax, you recognize there's a trailing factor that if you had losses, you don't those losses you, you can write off those losses for subsequent years. It tells me a little bit that from a state tax perspective, especially on the capital gains side, the state's going to suffer to that till at least 2014. Uh, that's my that's my take on it. Uh, I think 2014, if we see some kind of bump or leveling of where we are in revenues. 
um, I think that that would be reasonable. I think it could be longer than that, but I think that that's a reasonable estimate. That means we need to continue to expect that the state will put more obligation on municipalities. Um, some of that has translated for the first time ever in the municipalities. It looks like the municipalities given some tools to do things on their own. I'm a big advocate for the concept of home rule um, in Massachusetts, because technically we're a home rule state. We are not a home rule state. Technically, we're a home rule state, and that's how we're identified when others view Massachusetts. There's very little home rule in individual communities. And so you've seen, I testified before the legislature about uh, two, two and a half weeks ago on the municipal relief package, of which some of it includes, for the first time in a while, this discussion of some, of, uh, some autonomy in a municipal, municipal level. I'm not sorry, sure I support everything they're proposing, but it is the beginning of a dialogue where situate gets to make decisions about situate. And it's not the state making decisions about every community, because we're not one size fits all. Every community has different issues, different concerns, different costs. You know, place a um, charter school in a community near Situate, and the dollars migrate out. Well, that's a different issue that may be from a region that doesn't have a charter school, as an example. So I think uh, one of the things we must and I continue to advocate for is the autonomy to make decisions at a local level. Let the boards of selectmen, school committees, town meeting members have a share and a stake in making things better because in the short term we're not getting more money. We're just not. As it relates to um, what's going to happen in Situate and other places because of that, um, we, can, we, we are obligated to estimate revenue at the most conservative levels not at the most wishful levels. The governor's budget, with no disrespect to the governor that included a seals and mail tax, it, I would not have included those estimates when I first built the budget, which I did not. When the House came out and added 220 to 250 million based on the sales tax to their first House budget, didn't include that extra amount of money because they looked like there was some dispute. So our obligation is to be fiduciaries to our taxpayers and fiduciaries to residents, town meeting members, and being honest with our employees. This is what the numbers look like. Let's not make it, um, let's make it real. Let's make everybody aware of what the concerns are. It's remarkable how people actually understand what's happening. People read the paper, people know what's happening. Um, the unemployment rate in Massachusetts is at um, levels which we haven't seen in a while. People understand it. So our, our goal must be to be honest about who we are, not overestimate, and really be protective of our bond rating. Don't do things that the bond rating agencies would see as leaps of faith. Uh, if we do those things, then generally, you know, we, we're going to suffer through some difficulty and pain. But my concern, as I mentioned to the legislature, was if you view what we're currently experiencing as only a problem that lasts till 2014, then you will not make the change that helps municipalities. If Situate, whether I'm here or not, and I hope to be, makes decisions that only gets us to 2014 without looking at 2020, then we will come out of 2014 feeling sort of good for ourselves for about a year and realize we haven't built um, the future because we need to sustain ourselves with a difficult time and be ready to, to experience not growth, but certainly be able to come out of that in a positive way. So the more conservative we can be through 14, in my opinion, the better positioned any community is to make sure that they get to 2020 not limping there, but really making progress. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm all set, Mr. Chair. I thank you. Thank you very much Appreciate for coming in. Uh, the process, I think, from here on, I have a, uh, a sheet that Kim Donovan put out. If you'd be kind enough to maybe e email uh, five references yep, to her uh, tomorrow. Not that we're going to check them. We we'll probably, uh, I don't know that we haven't really talked about it, but I don't think. We're going to probably check until we get down to the finals, you know, but we'd really appreciate that. Our plan would be to to digest this information, digest tonight for a day or two, uh, probably vote next Tuesday night. We have a scheduled meeting uh, at which time our decision would become clear, hopefully, uh, and then notify the candidate. We still have the hopes of, of, of bringing someone on board on or about, if I said July 1st, last time we met, it's probably July 7th now, uh, but in that area. So that, that would uh, obviously, you know, after we contacted the 
uh, choice would work out some sort of a contract that would be agreeable to both uh, them and us. So that's basically the schedule going forward. Well, I, I appreciate your time again. Hopefully, um, hopefully I've expressed a little bit about who I am and, and why the position is important to me. And I uh, hope a week from Tuesday you're, you're giving me good news. Well, I, I, as I said before you came, before we started this whole process, uh, we all consider ourselves very fortunate to have the four people coming before us tonight that we have coming. It's, sure. it's, uh, Should I grab that from you now? Grab that from right now. Take it now. Thank you. Thank you. The board will take a quick two, uh, two or three minute break. and having the four candidates back that we, we have tonight. And uh, what we're going to do, similar to what we did in the prior interview, we're going to ask you to just give us five or six minutes of what brings you to sit with tonight, what went through your decision-making process to get here. Mm -hmm. And then we'll follow with some questions and uh, see where it goes. So it's really informal. <coughs> and go ahead. That sounds Introduce great. Thank you. Yourself. thank you for coming. And thank you again for having me. I truly appreciate it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I, uh, I actually live in Duck Hurry, uh, just a few miles down the road. Um, I'm familiar with Situate mostly through my uh, wife's family who live here. Uh, been coming here for the last 15 years, particularly on the 3rd of July, uh, spending some time on the beach that evening. I'm a member of the Knights of Columbus here in town as well. Uh, and as I told you at my uh, first meeting with you, the best place to get a sub in this town is Maria's. And I went there two <laughs> weeks ago for dinner. It was wonderful, just as always. Um, aside from that, uh, for the last seven years, I've been working on the Cape. Uh, for the last three, I've been working in, for the town of Mashpee as the assistant town manager. And prior to that, I was working in the town of Harwich. Uh, first as the assistant town administrator, followed by the acting town administrator once the town administrator there had left for Manchester. Prior to that, I was working for the town of Lancaster <clears throat> off the 495 corridor as the community development and planning director, where I w oversaw the conservation department, planning department, uh, building department, board of appeals, planning board, and the conservation commission. And prior to that, I was working in Vermont, where I spent four years working for the town of Williston as their assistant pl town planner and zoning administrator. And then prior to that, I was working in Richmond, Vermont as the assistant town administrator there. <coughs> all in all, that adds up to about 15 years experience in municipal government. The reason that I'm here in Situate is because uh, when I saw this job open up, I thought this was a rare opportunity. It looked like an exceptional community to come to, one that I'm familiar with, uh, and it's right in my backyard. And it certainly seemed like uh, the timing was perfect, I hope, for you as well as for me. It looks like I, I know it's perfect for me, and I just hope that you'll agree with me. So hopefully that's Thank it in you. a nutshell. You're welcome. Uh, I guess the, the, and if I, with the board's <coughs> okay, I'll just start off with this question. You know, it's a, it's a step that's made all the time, but nevertheless, it's a big step. I mean, yes. you, 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 you're in competition with people who have had uh, town administrator, town management, experience anywhere from, I guess, a dozen years to over 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you're currently an assistant town manager in uh, Nashville and doing a fine job. Could you tell the board and tell the, the citizens why you think you're ready to take on the, the, the position of the town manager, a town administrator in a, in a, in a town? Sure. It's a great question. Um, and I, I understand uh, why you would ask it. It would seem that someone who's still got the title assistant in front of them might just be that, an assistant. Uh, in my case, I've had rare opportunities to be more than that. Currently, I'm also uh, serving as the chief financial officer where I oversee the assessing, accounting, and treasurer collector departments. So those are three direct reports that I have in addition to the employees underneath them. Uh, when I was in Harwich, I served as the acting town administrator, granted only for a three-month period, but it was a period of... Uh, interesting transition in that uh, when my 
previous boss left, I was left holding the bag on town meeting. And the first thing I had to do was rally the troops and make sure that we were a cohesive unit going into town meeting. And the paper later portrayed that town meeting as one of the more smooth and successful town meetings they had had. And they were usually a three-night marathon. In this case, I brought all the key financial departments, all the players to the table. We figured it out and got through it flawlessly, I thought. Also, whenever the town manager isn't there or the town administrator isn't there, I'm the guy in charge. I'm in the big chair making those decisions that I'm asked to make. Uh, I've done a lot of managerial work in those roles, either as the assistant or as the acting town administrator and the uh, assistant town manager. See, John? Oh, I, I was almost that exact same question. What it, Joe said there were other uh, finalists with a little more experience. Yes. What can you do? I look at you at like the, a younger guy. What can you do to convince us that, and, and, the, and the rest of us in this room, what can you do better than them? Can you put 12 hours, you know what I mean? Think of something that you sure. can do better than them, Rainey. There's a lot of things I'm going to do. I'm going to bring you um, a positive energy that, that uh, I've prided myself on for a number of years. Uh, every day when I come into work, I'm excited to be there at every job I've had, and that's always been sort of the marvel of my friends who sit there and say, God, I can't believe how much you like going to work every day. If you like what you do, you're going you're gonna to portray that and you're going to uh, help other people see your perspective and hopefully like the job that they're doing as much. I'm going to try and, like I said, the positive energy. I'm going to bring uh, 15 years worth of experience working in seven different municipalities. So I've seen quite a bit at several different levels. Um, I've worked at a lot of interesting positions. I've been the zoning administrator. I've been the planner. I've been the health officer. I've been a conservation agent. Uh, I've tried to do as much as I possibly could. I've been the treasurer collector twice in Mashpee. So I know how those departments work intimately. So I'm going to bring not just the administrative managerial function, but I've actually done it from the, from the lower levels all the way up to the top. Can Hopefully a well-rounded, broad spectrum okay. for a candidate. Just one other question, you, and you touched on it, it's in your resume, and you may have spoken about it the first time we met. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little more in detail about when you were the assistant TA in Howich, then you went to acting? Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that, and then was it your choice to get out of Howich and go to Mashpee? Uh, right. You know, it almost seems like a natural <coughs> transition. Yeah, right. Why didn't I stay there? That's a great question. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, my boss had left, and so I be was appointed the acting town administrator by the Board of Selectmen. Right. Uh, they had full faith and confidence in me. I had thought of applying to become the town administrator there, but a number of factors, uh, most notably the opportunity in Mashpee opened up, and I had applied prior to his departure. So I thought, well, I'll continue to pursue that avenue, and I did, and it was okay. an even better opportunity for me. All right. Thank you. Can well, I just, uh, how was it a better know. opportunity, if you can just keep Oh, I wanted to get going. budgeting experience. I wanted, uh, I wanted more experience dealing with uh, the three key financial departments, accounting, assessing, treasurer collection, and it gave me just that. But if you had gotten the town administrator position, that would have had that also, wouldn't it? It would have. But I liked the idea of being the CFO. Uh, it, it was a little closer to home, to be honest with you, also. Fifty miles a day got to be old one way, so I, fi I figured, well, I can reduce the commute from 100 miles a day to 60. And that was, that was actually a logical thing to do at that time because gas prices were starting to climb up. Sorry, Don. I yeah, no, I, just in that same vein, Mr. Reed, I, I look at this and I realize, you know, you've got a nice resume. I'm certainly not. <clears throat> but the concern I have is after looking at your resume and then saying to ourselves, okay, we're probably right now as a town and as a state in one of the worst financial situations in, in, in recent memory. And the problem I'm looking at is, is that while you've had some experience at various levels, I mean, how is it that you think that, you know, that you, you're going to better serve the town of Situate, given that you haven't gone through a financial downside from a managerial standpoint? And, and I think that's, that's what I'm looking at from, from my perspective. I'm saying, okay, we're in a, one of the worst times ever. Um, and how is it that, you know, you, given your, I, I realize you'd said that you've got some mixed experiences and, and obviously you the youth and the excitement and, and the, you know, the opportunity, but I'm saying that in and of itself isn't going to 
shall we say, manages through it. So, I, I mean, if we can get a little bit more substance as to what concretely do you think, from your experience, that you, you're going to be able to do to be able to steer this town, shall we say, going forward, given the, the size of its budget and the, the deficits and, the, and the, the problems that not just the town of Situate's facing, but obviously the, the Commonwealth. And I'm not talking about how you're going to deal with Massachusetts. I mean, with the deficiencies that we're getting from the state and the lack of funds from the feds and so on and so forth. You, I agree with you wholeheartedly. In fact, your uh, five-year financial plan says it best. We are in uncharted waters. Uh, this is a, a, a rare opportunity for anybody coming into this position because no one's been through it. Uh, we are seeing financial things happening now that haven't happened since the Great Depression, and there's no one around to recall how that was actually played out because no one's actively working in this field that was doing it at that time. Uh, management has changed a lot in the last 70 years also. More to your point. Um, when I was in Harwich, we were faced with override situations. They were not pleasant. They failed. Uh, we laid off employees. I have been through that. Uh, it was not easy, particularly uh, not just the uh, financial aspect of it. Then there's the whole morale component that comes with it. Uh, it's a rebuilding process. I know that Situate's facing, a, uh, I think, about a $730,000 shortfall, if I remember correctly, if I read it correctly in the paper. We're facing 330 in Mashpee. Uh, we're all looking at that. We're wondering what's the state going to do? What are the budget numbers going to be? How are we going to deal with this? Uh, I think uh, that your current town administrator, Mr. Agnew, said it best. Uh, we're going to have to see what's going to happen, and we may have to do more cuts. We're facing the same problem in Mashpee. I was just talking with Joyce yesterday, my boss there. We're going to go on a spending freeze July 1. You know, it isn't going to be Christmas in July the way it usually used to be when you get your budget and, oh, boy, we get to go run around and spend money. It isn't going to happen. We're closely monitoring our expenditures now. I mean, you, you gentlemen know that you're coming into the end of the, trying to close out the year. Where are we hitting our targets? We could be off by, you know, a million dollars in some of those cases if we don't get turnbacks. So it's, it's uh, you're right, it's not just cheerleading. It's making hard, hard decisions, some of which I've had to make at different levels and different positions. Did that answer your question? Well, partially. Um, just a, a few other follow-ups. Um, just kind of moving on. I mean, you kind of touched on it. I mean, how do you deal with employees with morale, okay, given, again, if you were to be the town administrator for Situate, I mean, how do you approach this issue given that there could be cuts, there could be some kind of furloughs, there could yeah. be, you know, uh, you know, exactly how do you approach it? How would you manage that situation? The way I've done it in the past is uh, create an issue where it becomes an ownership concept, where if people are on board with an idea early on, they're more apt to take an active role in it. And by so becoming part, part owner in that concept, then they have more invested in it. For instance, uh, if there were to be a furlough program, we had explored that in Mashpee about six <coughs> months ago. One of the first things I did was figure out if we needed to do a furlough program, one of the ways to do it would be to create a payment plan so that people could actually pay themselves and figure out how they could float through, let's say, the five days that they weren't going to be paid if we could help them out by figuring out a payment plan so that they could actually be paid for those five days off just by storing away a little bit of money week after week, putting it aside so that it would make the pain a lot less. When they're brought, when you bring people to the table early on and have them buy into a concept, generally speaking, you're going to find that morale will be there because they have a vested interest in it. Just on another area, have you been involved in any type of capital campaigns? And when I mean capital, I mean like, you know, structural, whether it's a town hall or a school or yes. um, um, could you just expound on that? Certainly. Right now we're in the process of building a um, eight and a half million dollar library in Mashpee. Uh, it'll be the first or second lead certified library in the state. Um, I've done all the procurement from designer selection uh, to uh, right now I'm actually doing the procurement for the uh, book security system, the uh, radio frequency ID system. Uh, I'm pretty well versed in procurement. We also just finished a two and a half million dollar fire substation in Mashpee as well. So I've done horizontal, vertical, and uh, all, all other aspects of procurement from 30B to chapter 149, 30, 30 through 9M, all that stuff. And have you had any experience with any local um, emergency planning within those yes. communities? Which um, ones have you had and what have you done? I'm NIM certified. That's the National Incident Management System. Uh, through the, I think the fire department ran our program. Uh, I'm one of the key contacts for hurricane preparedness. 
that kind of thing? Is that what you meant? That and I was thinking more in the wake of the recent swine flu and obviously the Asian oh. uh, flu. I was thinking myself, you know, obviously, you know, we have certainly through hurricanes and, and, and yeah. we have that clearly We all know how to deal place. with that, right? But, Pull you know, more importantly, in the event that there was some kind of pandemic, yes. you know, I hate to say that, but I'm like, it's a potential and it's always been, and of course, more recently. So I was curious, what kind of experience have you had? We have a... Uh, 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 children's daycare that we run in the town of Mashpee. It's actually a town-run facility through an enterprise fund. Um, and we had a MRSA outbreak there a year and a half ago. Uh, <laughs> my boss happened to be on vacation at the time it happened, and I was the guy in charge working with our uh, health department. So we dealt with that. You might want to ask, how did I deal with it? First thing we did was put the cleaning cars right out in front of the building because we didn't want to leave any mistake for any of the par parents who had kids there to let them know that we were dealing with it head on, that we were cleaning the building from top to bottom, which essentially is what it all boiled down to anyways. So, worked out very well. Knock Thank you. Wood. Yeah, um, Rainey, you're obviously an enthusiastic guy and that's a, that's a good thing because there are definitely dark times in any person's job and sometimes the enthusiasm is the only thing that gets you through. Um, as these guys have heard me say, you know, many times, I, I love my job and they see how I, I love my job, but there are characteristics of my job that I absolutely can't stand. And it takes all sorts of personal discipline for me to be able to, to do them half-assed, let alone, you know, well. Um, you do have a fair number of experience in terms of di number of different municipalities. And I see there's a balance between the numbers of municipalities versus total number of years. And so that, to me, that, that works out okay. But you, you have been... Uh, exposed to a bunch of different systems and so on. What, what are the common threads to being a town administrator that you actually probably don't enjoy as much as other aspects and that you find yourself having to discipline yourself to saying, okay, Rainey, this part of the job sucks, but you got to do it. Stinks, rather. Stinks, I, stinks, yes. I understood. <laughs> He's in the, speaking in the vernacular. I'm a fan yes. of that myself. Yeah. I'm just not here. Um, I've never met a town administrator or a town manager that liked doing department, eva department head evaluations. I concur with that statement. I don't relish them. I find them interesting. I find them to be a u very useful tool. But I'll tell you, sometimes there are just there are those days where you sit there in front of that computer screen thinking, wow, I've got to go back over the last year and figure out what this person has done. So <coughs> in effort, because I have to do department head evaluations myself uh, for the financial departments, in an effort to make that process easier and perhaps more palatable, over the course of the year, I will sit down and make sure that I keep more copious notes on those department heads so that I can say, oh, okay, this was an interesting thing that he or she did. I'll remember that. And then I keep a file on that, yeah. you know, just an electronic file. Yeah. So that when I get time, when it comes time, you know, a month before they're due, then it's a lot easier process. If I can take the tedium out of it, I, I find the process to be a little more palatable. Do you sit down with the department heads? Oh, yeah. You, uh, how often do you do that? You know, one-on-one -on -one in, in a job evaluation sense. Since you, oh, in an since evaluation you sense? Yeah, since well, you mentioned it. it. It's interesting because the way I portray my relationship with my uh, co-workers and the department heads that I oversee and my boss in any of my positions, I've always considered it to be what I call a running conversation. I don't have to surprise them with a visit, nor do they surprise me. I'm a huge fan of open doors. Uh, so it isn't like, hey, here I am, you know, start dancing, start, start making yourself look busy. I'm not into that. Right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always kept abreast of what it is they're doing because they're interested in letting me know. I hate surprises, and as a result, the people I work with don't care for them either, uh, particularly the board. Uh, I can tell right. you one thing if I work here. You won't be surprised by anything because I detest them, and I, I never want to see the board or my boss in a position where they are sitting there saying, gee, I didn't know that. That isn't going to happen. I do not like that. Okay. Thanks. Tony? And I should follow up by saying, yeah, yeah. as such, the, the people that I oversee don't like surprises as well, so I'm never surprised either. Yeah, That's right. why the running conversation seems yeah, to work so well. Yeah, it goes both ways for sure. Yeah. Yeah, up and down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, oh. Yeah, just a, a quick... A quick comment, you know, you're a finalist, you know, we go through this process and, and, you know, we've already had the comments where we talk to you about the details of what you do and, yes. and what your financial background is and how you feel about managing people. So, you know, right now we're really attacking areas that we think we want to get more information out. Sure. So, but congratulations, you're a finalist. Thank you. Um, 
The um, the one thing that's noticeable that I think John and, and Sean were talking about a little bit is Situate does not have an assistant right. town administrator. So so you, in coming in here, won't even have the strength of yourself or support of yourself coming in here. So that's part of the reason why we're trying to dig into what, you know, your ability, as I think Sean said, you're a younger candidate. We, we see expectations of you being here for 20 years. And, Me and too. You know, you're doing, you know <laughs> that's, that's the strengths. The question mark, as other, everybody has one, is, you know, are you ready to make that leap? And that's, that's why we're digging here. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to ask you about, and I asked it to a prior person, um, a little bit different. What, what processes have you implemented now that when you come here, you're going to make sure that we're doing, or you're going to implement them right away. And last time the answer that I got was more on specifics of what I'm going to look at and, and get. But, but really, is there a process or something that you found over your 15 years of experience where you say, you know, this was really helpful for me in doing my job better, and I want to make sure that they're doing it in situ. Mm -hmm. There are a number of things. Um, as we had discussed previously, one of the things that you have done here <coughs> that I am a tremendous fan of, and I'm delighted to see it actually in your charter, is your... Uh, five-year financial forecasting. I, it is brilliant. It's a, it's a smart move. Um, I wish more communities did it. That's one thing I'm, I'm a huge fan of. Uh, on, a, on a more day-to-day, week-to-week level in terms of the relationship with the board, I'm one who uh, enjoys keeping folks like you informed of what's happening, whether it be through a daily email or a weekly email or a weekly report just to let you know, here's what's happening. I think, I think one of the uh, key aspects of the success for the candidate in this position is the open flow of communication between yourselves and whoever's sitting in the town administrator position. Is that answering your question? Um, a little bit, but more along the lines of, you know, I went into this job and I found that they weren't having weekly meetings. Hmm. So I found that by me meeting with my department heads on every Tuesday for breakfast, it really opened things up. You know, no, I'm with you. Or I, I'm with you. Thank yeah. you. Two aspects I can give you on that, and, and they both come from Harwich. Uh, one, I was a huge fan of either myself or my boss getting out in the field and leaving the office once in a while to actually see what's going on at the fire department. Gee, what are the police guys doing today? How are things down at the harbor? Being an active person out in the community, and not just at the department head buildings, but perhaps at social functions. Maybe there are things happening at the senior center or somewhere else where that face and that name for the town administrator need to be present in the community. The second thing I, I used to do in Harwich, uh, do it also in Mashpee. In Mashpee it's with the financial departments, uh, but in uh, Harwich it was more with the harbor and the uh, building construction departments, you know, the planning health. We kept weekly meetings. Very simple, very easy. Sometimes they took 20 minutes, sometimes they took a little longer than 20 minutes. Just to know what each department was doing. It was kind of nice because you got a sense of, okay, here's the issue of the week, here's what we need to deal with this coming week, here's what we've been dealing over the last week. So I, I try to keep an active hand in things without micromanaging. The idea is you've hired managers that are in place that know their jobs, that know what they're doing, so that you don't need to babysit. Thank you. Thank you. Randy, thank you again. Congratulations for making the thank you. Four. We're going to... The procedure going forward will be hopefully a relatively simple one. I have here a, a, a Jim Donovan uh, email address. I would ask you tomorrow, if you would, to email her with, say, five references that we may or may not be calling, depending upon the sure. way we go. We certainly won't uh, bother people uh, for, and candidates who are not choice. We'll probably try to narrow it down to the first, our actual choice. Yep call any references. Uh, plans still remain pretty much the same. We'd like to have someone on board during the first week in July. You have mm -hmm. an administrable government. You know how it works. I do indeed. The best laid plans sometimes uh, <laughs> go awry, but that's our plan anyway. Mm -hmm. So I would say that ho hopefully you'll be hearing from, from me over the weekend. Uh, Terrific. Uh, shortly after Tuesday when we when we vote. I look forward to that phone call. All right. Thank you again for coming in. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I truly Thank appreciate you. the opportunity. You Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Mark, nice to see you hey, again. How are you? Goodbye. Thank you. Good to see you, Mark. How's it going? Good to see you.
Say again. And block of wire. Good. I can, I can get them right away. Yeah. Maybe it's a block. Live on the radio? Well, live on television. Uh, mm. And radio. Yep. And the radio, right? Oh. And the radio. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for coming in tonight. And congratulations. I, I might add on. We had a, a an outstanding, I think we all, all of us who went through the resumes and went through the the uh, interviews, uh, an outstanding group of candidates. And we congratulate you for being here tonight in the, in the, shall we call it, the top four. And what we're going to ask you to do, we, we have talked to you, the board has talked to you before, so some of it may seem a little redundant, and I hope it doesn't to you, but uh, in order to bring everybody up to date. What I'd like to do is just ask you uh, briefly, four or five minutes, Tell us what brought you here tonight. Why you decided, uh, after being a town administrator in Stoughton for the length of time you have been, to apply to Situate and come down here and uh, make application for this for this position? So if you would. That'll be very easy. The yeah. uh, reason why I applied to Situate is because you have a beautiful town. Uh, just look at the waterfront, you look at the homes, you look at the, uh, the ambiance of the community, uh, the financials, you have a strong community. You have good, solid municipal services. You have a reputation. Uh, the previous town administrator has been here for a, a long number of years. You have stability, uh, relative, you know, compared to politics everywhere. But in, in situate, you certainly seem to have political stability. You have been on the board, Mr. Norton, for tw over 20 years. Uh, and that's very attractive to someone like myself. Uh, for the information that, you know, people will be wanting to know, but you can't ask. I'm 51 years old. I've been married 27 years. I have three kids. My youngest of one is in, is in high school. And uh, I'm not looking to job hop. I'm looking to uh, come to a place in a good community. And uh, I have the experience. And I've, I, I think I have the, the skills that would serve Situate well. Thank you. Very precise. And, and thank you for that. And what we're doing now is just opening it up to the board in no particular order. Any questions uh, that any board member might have, is either a new question or one we might have asked you before? Rick, that aside. Um, last time around, we talked a lot about finances, and uh, primarily some of the other folks asked you some pretty detailed questions about finances. And I'm not a real financial nitty-gritty guy myself, but I am interested in your in your view on, given that you are a um, town manager currently. What your view is long term about the state, the state of the state, um, how that trickles down to the state of the towns and the municipalities, some of the challenges you might see facing a town like Situate. I don't expect you to know, you know, huge details about what, what's going on right here right now, but just from a more macroscopic point of view, and also sort of the time frame over which you think that these budgetary challenges are going to be particularly acute. Uh, I think Situate, as well as other towns in the South Shore, are going to experience some rough times for at least two to three years. Uh, this particular year, everyone's experienced cuts. They've, they've experienced decrease in the state um, aid. Uh, I think that's going to continue into 2010, certainly only because their revenues are going to lag behind any, any uptick in the economy. And I wouldn't see that coming for at least a couple of years. So uh, there's, there's going to be tough times ahead. Uh, and tough times are going to be making choices on services, on, on delivery, on what types of services uh, you want to fund. Obviously, you want your core services, police, fire, public works. You want a strong education base. And then, and then you'll, you'll make decisions as to, uh, as to uh, uh, what I want to call the point of services. Are, are you, what particular type of service is most important to the residents and to the board, and how do you, how do you produce that? I mean, at some point in time, uh, with, it, with other communities, I know in Stoughton we've experienced the same thing. We've had to cut back. We've had reductions in staff, which does mean some reductions in services, but we try to prioritize those uh, as to what's important to, you know, to the townspeople and, and to the board. So that's what I see happening, and I, and I see that you're going to probably need someone who's you know, experienced that. You're going to need someone who is going to be able to hang tough, so to speak, uh, through the tough time. It's, it's easy to be a manager in any community when the money's flowing and, and mm -hmm. times are good and you got all the programs and everyone's happy. It's a little tougher when, 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 when times are tough. Do you have any experience or just even theoretical thoughts about 
some mechanisms that may or may not save money, uh, like regionalization? And what other sort of mechanisms do you think that might be worth exploring? You have the, the typical, the, uh, uh, the normal things that people look at. They look at uh, health insurance costs, which is probably a very large portion of the particular budget. You want to look at that. Uh, insurances, uh, other types of insurances. Then you're going to be down to your biggest cost is going to be personnel. Mm -hmm. uh, other things that you can look at, uh, utility. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether or not you consolidate utilities and purchase them either with the schools in conjunction with the schools or you purchase them regionally. Uh, there's also regional purchase groups. In, in where I am in the South Shore, we have a, a, a consortium that puts particular products out to bid. There's always the state bid list. That's always a place where you can try to save some money, especially for journal items, police cruisers, stock items, those sort of things. Uh, and regionalization works best on that, at that particular level, yeah. uh, I've seen. And we use it in Stoughton. Okay, thanks. Is this for now? Yeah. Um, just a, a couple quick questions. Just so, and, and we went through your history in detail, but just a, a couple questions on, on why you're leaving Stoughton in terms of this, you're looking for this in your, in your current status. I think your con is your contract up in? Uh, uh, June of 2010. In, June of, right, so it is in, I mean, you've got a contract for another year. Correct. Um, you kind of went while you like the community here. Um, what is the, someone asked a good question earlier in terms of people know that you're a finalist now. Yes. And, and what was the, the reaction in terms of, you know, the, the people that you work closely with and, and the board and all that sort of? Uh, most would be sad to see me go. Um, but wish me the best, and of course, there's always a there's always a group of people that uh, um, holding the champagne cork. Uh, right. But I would say that that's a that's a minority. Right. Um, I, I had a, a another question. Has in Stoughton have you pursued any environmental projects and any um, green type initiatives in in the town? Uh, not real green initiatives that I could think off the top of my head. I mean, most of what we've done in Stoughton was uh, purchase land for conservation purposes. We, we purchased uh, numbers of acres of land uh, to put in trust. And uh, I'm going to say uh, the last piece that we were looking at included a pond was like 96 acres. So for, for town in size, we probably have, I'm going to say about 250 acres in conservation. That's where they put most of their effort in as far as those types of green initiatives. We did work with the school with, with an engineering firm to look at energy alternatives, um, but the only one that would work for us, uh, we don't get enough wind for, for wind turbines, only one place. Uh, it looks like solar panels would work. Geothermal, if we built new, we might be able to use them, but for existing buildings, geothermal is just too expensive to retrofit into the building. So solar looks like it's, it's, uh, it's it for, you know, for Stoughton. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've asked this question to a few of the candidates. It, when you come here, um, what are you going to be able to take from your past jobs in terms of initiatives that you've started that you're going to want to make sure that are implemented here if we're not already doing it? Well, I think the biggest thing that I'm going to be able to give you is um, communication, hopefully transparency when we make decisions. And, and we're going to have to build up you know, trust and loyalty as to uh, how we go about making the decisions and uh, how that's uh, projected into the public uh, so that they're comfortable with the decisions that they make. They know about them. There's no surprises. Uh, the biggest thing that I can do for the community is to is risk avoidance. I mean, the biggest thing any town manager can do is, is not put the town at risk because when you put the town at risk uh, and things go and you have trouble, trouble costs money. And that's something you want to avoid at all costs. And I think I, I could bring that to you. And how do you do that? How do you, how do you eliminate risk? You don't, you can't eliminate risk. The only thing you can do is mi minimize it. And, and how you minimize risk is you have to have the ability to see a potential problem before it grows bigger and uh, utilize your resources, be they uh, staff, because you have a good professional staff, uh, town council or legal services, to try to get ahead of the curve uh, in, in order to, to nail down potential weak points before uh, it comes to the to the forefront, and I'm and I would think mainly the best examples would be uh, if you have uh, labor issues, if you have uh, potential legal claims, uh, hot ones are like 40 Bs. Everyone's suing everyone on 40 Bs. 
uh, we have we have some suits going on like that so if you can put your money and your efforts up front it, it usually save you on the end right and last just and what is there like a specific thing I think you're hitting on it I think you, you got on the communication piece but what what do you as the town administrator do with your employees or look at that allows you to do that stuff like is it I mean I think you touched on communication how do you communicate with them how do you how do you what information are you looking for that you're gonna look for here so that that all happens is um, the first thing you look for is you look for a professional staff because obviously I'm only one person I'm only going to be able to do so much if you have professional staff and you have professional people they will they will carry the ball on, on most occasions as far as getting the information for, from them various methods and, and they you, you have to look at the individual some people like to communicate by email some like phones some like face-to-face -face conversations uh, I and I usually have a, a staff meeting at least uh, every two weeks uh, where we sit together, all the department heads. Most of the time, it's 20 minutes or so of going over what's happening at, at, the, at the board level, going over the selectman's agenda. And then we open it up for what's happening in other departments. And it's a time where folks who normally don't get together and talk do get together and talk. And you'd be amazed at the amount of information that comes out for other issues that they're not even thinking about that affects them. Uh, Thanks. That has worked yep. well for me. Thank you. Mark, I think uh, as, as town administrator, every town <coughs> administrator, I think makes makes easy decisions sometimes. Some, some of them are easy. Some of them are very difficult. Uh, and let's zero in on St in, in Stoughton. I know you've had some difficult decisions to make. What would you consider your most difficult decision, and, and what, how did you handle it? What did you do? Well, um, if you knew the outcome, all decisions are easy. Uh, it's the ones where you don't know what's going to happen. most di difficult decision I had to make uh, involved the police corruption issue in the town of Stoughton that involved the chief of police, the sergeant, and another officer um, that were... Uh, indicted and the chief was uh, convicted and so is the sergeant. The sergeant is currently incarcerated <coughs> at the state correction institution and that was very difficult because those individuals were born and raised in the town and uh, I was quote the outsider and it was difficult to maintain a stance to do the right thing in that particular atmosphere and uh, I did pay a, 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 a high price uh, personally to go through that process it was very traumatic uh, eventually everything did go to court and as I said uh, the chief was convicted of a felony uh, for an e attempted extortion and, and, and the sergeant is incarcerated so um, but there was no guarantee it was going to come out that way but he did if you look back that is that and I'm sure that was a tough decision uh, that was that was probably one of the toughest decisions I've ever made in my career yeah I can understand that. It's, it's, uh, none of them are easy, I guess. I don't no. think about it, but that's <laughs> that ranks up there and top this. Uh, in, in that same vein, it kind of goes to two questions I have, Mark. Um, but um, how is it? You know, I've, I've kind of pitched the question as as far as the financial climate. But how did you deal with the town morale with your other staff heads or, or department heads? I know it's obviously there was a crisis going on. You're the town administrator for for Stoughton. I mean, how is it that you handled? managing the remaining departments through this crisis and u utilizing that as a, a, a as a analogy to the present situation i mean how, how would you go about addressing that issue if, with given the financial crisis if you're a town administrator well that's that's a um, question where you have to force communication i mean uh, s some folks you you actually have to drag you know you, you have to force them order them at the staff meetings make sure that they're there uh, make sure that if you, you can't get through, through through telephone that you then you start having to do emails or, or memorandums to keep those folks uh, informed as to what's as to what's going on. I mean, obviously, um, the best thing you can do is is, is talk to them and deal with them, uh, you know, face to face as individuals, and mention that it's it's not necessary for individuals to like each other or be friends with each other in order to do a job. You know, there's, there's a job to be done and as long as they 
they know what needs to be done there's that expectation and they follow through it, uh, to be blunt it doesn't matter if they hate my guts or not as long as the job gets done that's that's really what matters um, the other uh, some questions I had was um, have you had um, I think your budget in Stoughton is it around is it 70 million somewhere in that uh, it's uh, we've got of... about 68 million general fund and about 14 million enterprise um, during your time that you've been in Stoughton, have you had to deal with any operational overrides? No. Uh, Stoughton has never had an override. Uh, my previous town in the town of Webster, we did have a debt exclusion for a school. Most of the communities I've been in, it's uh, been fiscally more restrictive. You had to really watch your dollars uh, because the proposition of overrides didn't have a lot of support. So uh, we had to watch our nickels and dimes a lot more. In that same vein, have you had a, a experience, obviously, I know that you've had commercial growth in Stoughton, which uh, was on your resume, um, but with respect to, like, capital buildings and structures for the town, whether it's a, a town hall or a senior center or, or a school, what kind of experience have you had uh, in, in trying to, more recent experience, I guess, is what yeah, I'm looking at. I, I mean, like a fair amount. I mean, my, my first project was uh, when I worked as the assistant city manager in Norwich. It's about, uh, that's about... Uh, about 38,000 population, and uh, I'll, I'll put it in a plug. It does have a harbor, and it does have a federal turning basin, and they do bring oil barges up it, so I, you know, I have some experience with, with, with some waterfronts. Uh, we did a, a senior center there. Uh, in Webster, uh, we did a new fire station for about a half a million dollars, and we did a, a revamp of the town hall for about a million two, which was mainly electrical infrastructure. It, was, it had 1920s wiring that we had to upgrade. Uh, we also did a lot of water and sewer projects, uh, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of extensions. Uh, there's a lake there, and uh, uh, the lake is Chagagagag, Manchagagag, Chibungagungamog. Largest natural lake in the state, 1,400 acres, for which uh, we watered and sewered it because it was, it was septic and well over there. And we spent probably about $15 million, and we were one of the first communities to get the SRF loans at the 0%. Mm. And, and we, pushed it through and it's worked out wonderfully for them. Uh, Stoughton, uh, I was on the tail end of a public works where they rehabbed the public works uh, facility. Uh, their fire station and police station are fairly new, it's less than 10 years old. Uh, the biggest project that I had there was the, uh, I was on the tail end of the connection with the NWRA, but that was that was a bid job, it was, was, a, was a contractor job, it wasn't a town job, we just had to, you know, basically Monitor. watch them and sit on it. Um, one other question I had is, what kind of experience have you had with respect to, like, local emergency planning? And, and really what I'm focusing on is more like any type of outbreaks, uh, pandemics or epidemics, um, and, and how is that prioritized in Stoughton? Well, we have, we're fortunate to have a public health nurse association that's in the town hall. It's one of our enterprise funds. So we have nurses on staff in the town hall that go out and, and, and do the visiting nursing end of it. Them, the nurses, along with the Board of Health, uh, do a wonderful job and they have emergency plans along with the schools to set up emergency dispensing centers, uh, that, that type of activity. Those plans are already in place along with the fire department. Uh, but uh, our nurses there are leading the charge on that one. The only other experience I had uh, was we had an E. coli outbreak in, uh, in Webster in a water supply. And, uh, of course, that causes quite a bit of angst amongst the, uh, the residents. Uh, in fact, we even had the uh, National Guard come in uh, to do uh, some reverse osmosis uh, public water supply, and we set up down by the lake so people could get uh, water at no charge during that, during that time if they wanted it. Thank you. Sean? <coughs> yeah, you mentioned Joe had asked you what your tough, toughest job was. This is going to be my toughest, and I can probably speak for the rest of the board here. You are at an advantage. There are four finalists, and you're the last to come in. So I asked this question once before of another candidate for a different reason, but you being the last, what can you say that's going to make me favor you over any of the others? Mark, I, I, I like what I heard, your answers, your experience, but what will you bring to this town more so than 
a younger guy or a person with more experience. But you know, I mean, uh, we, 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 you know, the, you're in, a you're, in a, you're in a, you're in a, you know, a tough competition. So it's you know, it's basically uh, what I th what I think I can bring for you is is this is that, uh, you know, I live in the South Shore area. Uh, I live about uh, you know, 35 minute drive from here. Uh, as I stated earlier, I have a. I have a, my youngest son is in high school, so uh, for the time being, uh, I would be a, a commuter. What, you, what you're going to get from me is, I'm, if you look at my resume, I'm not particularly much of a job hopper. I'll, I'm certainly looking for a place um, to uh, finish what I think is a pretty good career in and in, in situate, which I think is a great town. Um, so I think... You know, I would certainly, you know, bring that to you. What I'm also going to bring to you is based upon what's happened to me in other communities. I'm not the kind of guy who's going to cut and run. Uh, when, when times get tough, it's not like I'm going to put my resume out, and I did not during all the, the all the controversy that was going on. I was not seeking other jobs. I was there to finish it out to the end. Uh, as I stated before, anyone is going to be able to manage your town when times are good. Uh, who's going to stand by you when times are tough? You know, and it's and it gets back to the relationship with the board and, and the communication and the trust and the, and the loyalty that's going to bring you through those times. So if what you're looking for, what I think you're looking for, is someone who's going to be around a while, I, I think I'm your guy um, because I'm at the right age. I got uh, quite a bit of experience uh, with that, and uh, you, know, you won't have to search for another town administrator. And, and, and I think that would be uh, uh, advantageous to you. Thank you. Thanks. Fletcher, further, Rick? Five years from now, say you get this job, you get the good call in a couple of weeks from us. Five years from now, what skills have you improved of your own? What sort of challenges are you particularly looking forward to in terms of your own abilities, things you might not have had experience with in your past that you would hope to develop here I I over the next five years? Not five years from now, I mean you're done, but just you know, medium time, time frame? I would say I would want to have more experience in emergency preparedness. Uh, you are a shoreline community. You're susceptible to more of those types of activities. So I, I would certainly want to be uh, better at that. I would also want to uh, have a better relationship with the state legislative delegation. Uh, uh, the relationship we have in Stoughton is, 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 is not as good as it should be. Communication, mainly. Uh, is it a lack of a relationship or a friction type uh, thing? It's not a friction. It's it's uh, we don't get a lot of communication. Not not as much as I not as much as I'm used to. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm interesting point. In my previous community in the town of Webster, our state rep lived in town, so it was very easy to uh, to communicate with him to see what's going on. You could go with him and have a have a coffee. You could meet with him for breakfast. And in Stoughton, our reps don't live in town, and it's difficult. To, to get a hold of them. Uh, I mean, they're very good. They'll, they'll call you back or email you, but it's not the same type of personal relationship, you know, that I'm used to. I'd like to develop that more here because uh, I think that's important to have your finger on the pulse as what's going on in Beacon Hill because uh, that's, uh, you still get a substantial amount of money, you know, through local aid and, and also if there, if there are projects that are coming on, whether they be the federal stimulus package that's now passing through the states, in Massachusetts, it's going to go through the legislature. So, I mean, you really have to have your finger on the pulse and know when these things are going to be coming out. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to develop that kind of relationship as well. Okay. Thanks. That was an interesting answer. Yeah. Tony, I'm good. All set, Joe. Thank you. I think that, that does it. Uh, thank you very much. Could have been that quick. Huh? Well, it was a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we, it was about a half an hour. Yeah. Well, let's see us back. Believe it or not, we're... we're a minute, two minutes ahead of schedule. So, do you have uh, any? Uh, I'm Ed, sorry. Go ahead. Do you have any questions of us? I do. I have one. Maybe I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> a I made it for 45 seconds. No, I, I can't pronounce the, the name I of Blake. I remembered it from the last time. The only question I'd like to ask is what has to happen within the first six months so that the selectmen, so that this board is convinced that they made the right, the right choice. It's a, it's a, a good question to be asked. <laughs> I'll, I'll, Is that directed to the chairman, Mark? <laughs> I think the fact that you're still here might be. <laughs> let me let me attempt to to, uh, to give my answer, and the board will certainly give theirs. 
I think at the end of a six-month period, uh, if we find that, that you are happy with your job and it's everything, the town is everything that you expected it to be, that you outlined tonight, that would make us feel very good. I think from our point of view, if we saw a person uh, in you or whoever we might choose who uh, was able to come into town, not change the town in six months, we know that's not, maybe not change the town at all, but who got the support of not only ourselves, but the department heads in the building, department heads throughout town, and most important, the citizens, I think we'd all be very happy at that stage of the game. That's my I just, I, oh, go ahead, John. I would just say that, you know, if, if, if in six months the board has to address the issue, then that person's probably not going to be here uh, that seventh month. Um, I think it's fair to say the expectations of the new town administrator for that person to come in is going to be looking at 12 months to 18 months. Um, I don't, I personally don't think, that, you know, I'm expecting dramatic changes, but like any person, they're going to put their own imprint in their own way. And I expect that whoever he or she is, that they will add something that is going to benefit the town. Now, I don't know whether it's going to be from a management style, with the department heads, whether it's going to be a community outreach experience with the, with the, um, the people who situate. But I think it's fair to gauge over a 12 to 18 month period, there will be change and we'll get the vibes. I'm sure the town administrator will get the vibes. Um, and of course, I don't want to be looking in seven months or 12 months saying, okay, we've got a new person, we've got to look for a new person. So I think, you know, it's a fair question to ask, but I think, you know, the selection process and going through this and going through all the, the numerous re resumes, interviewing first time through executive session and then bringing, of course, you, Mark, as well as three other candidates before us, um, we did so because we've asked a lot of questions, we've vetted out a lot of things to really kind of hone in on hopefully four candidates that could take and assume that position and do a, a good job for the town. And so um, I'm hoping that we're not going to have it in six months. Uh, I don't think the expectation should be because I don't, given the financial situation we're going through, the economy's changing, the state's budget's changing, not just on a monthly but weekly basis, I think it would be unfair for us to say, oh, in six months you haven't gotten this out of the hole, so therefore... <laughs> I'm not saying you're suggesting that, but I mean, that's the reality of it. So I think, you know, the, the person who comes in here is going to have latitude to do a good a job, hopefully a good job, and, and obviously, you know, in 12 to 18 months, we're going to know how good that job is. That's my expectation. John? Oh, well, I'm sorry I asked that question, but <laughs> to, just to repeat what I'm the... I'm sorry. No, no, that's, no, that's <laughs> all right. No. I mean, you look behind you, you have many department heads here, you have residents. I think what Joe and John kind of said the same thing. Not much will change, and that's not such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. There are things that you'll do differently than Rick Agnew, and there will things, hopefully, you do the same. So I, I think, like John alluded to, six months is, is, is too quick. But I hope in six months, whoever's sitting in that chair over there, and things keep going the way they're going. I don't think things are so bad here. I don't right. think they are either. Really don't. So it's... This is I think things here, yeah. all things considered, I think they, things here are, are, are run very well. That's one of the reasons why I applied for the position. Right. Rick? Any it's six months, like these guys said, six months pretty short fuse. You know, you still got to figure out where the post-its are located and all that sort of stuff, and where the office supplies are. Six I, months. Uh, but um, there aren't any <laughs> six months. Yeah, so. that's right. Sorry, we took care of that one last week. Yeah. Um, frankly, though, I'd like some ideas. I mean, the new t the new TA, all four of the candidates are very intelligent, eyes open, have varying degrees, of varying different types of work experience in the past. So certainly some ideas. I'm not looking for someone to jump in and start, you know with two feet and start making all sorts of huge changes. But frankly, I, I do think there's some opportunities for changes in the town. Um, I think every town has an obligation to consider changes over certain time frames. Um, Rick Agnew has been here for, you know, 20 years, 19 years, and uh, he's done a great job in many, many ways. And as the TA, as you know, you get a lot of flack that is very undeserved and he's gotten a lot of flack that's undeserved. And so I think a, um, 
a new TA coming in, we really need to start being very careful about um, you know, what they hear and making sure they're separating out the, the BS that's getting thrown at them and developing the skill set of and the, and the tone of the town um, and identifying some things that we can do better. Um, the town is remarkably well run. We've been very fiscally conservative, which I think is great. Um, Agnew in particular, I marvel at his financial abilities. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you can have, in six months, if you can have a tenth of his financial abilities, then you're doing really well, okay? Um, and, uh, but, you know, after six months, there should be some ideas, uh, nothing implemented, but uh, I'm always willing to listen to uh, get broken out of my own comfort zone. Uh, there's some things that I know we do really well here, um, but I'd be interested if other people think we do those same things well or not, or how we can do them better. I, uh, I'll be brief. It's you know six months. You're still going up the learning curve. I would expect you to have um, avenues of communication with all your department heads and start building those relationships. And I would expect you to have a good base understanding of our financial condition, and a good understanding of where we stand with the state. And no, I mean we just got another email today that said the numbers changed again. So, you know, um, they, they come out every week. Right. So, every you know, day. I would. I would expect you to understand where we sit right now and be part of the planning to where we're going to be six months from, from then. So, Thank you. Thank you. Mark, thank you. Uh, going forward, I think I'm going to give you now a, a uh, when, you, when we finish, a uh, email, Kim Donovan's email address. I want to ask you sometime within the next day or so if you'd be good enough to... Uh, Send here a list of say five references that we could that we could check. Well, we, we you know we uh, we will check the finalists, maybe the two finalists, or whatever the case might be. But, but uh, let me give you that. If you can send a, send that to her, we'll take it from there. Okay. I would appreciate that. The process going forward. Again, uh, I'm saying it with a, with not a lot of surety. We would hope. Uh, my intention would be to make a decision next Tuesday night. The board to vote on uh, their choice for the new town administrator. It may or may not happen. The you know, board may need more time to digest it. I don't know. Uh, but that would be my thought to, to do that next Tuesday, which is the ninth. Uh, contact the, co the candidate uh, the, who was chosen shortly thereafter, the next day, hopefully. Either meet with that candidate, probably meet with that candidate, draw up a uh, salary schedule, the uh, memorandum of understanding of a contract, so we'd both be on the same page, know what we're getting into on both sides, and uh, hopefully the candidate would accept and that would, that would uh, be the end of the process. With the hopes of bringing the candidate on board by the first week in July, the end of the first week of July, it may even be <laughs> towards the middle of July. So, uh, as, as this as this as this uh, meeting's gone on, my date has gone further ahead. But you you know you know town government, you know municipal government. Sometimes the, it works a little slow. But again, I, I congratulate you as I did all the other candidates, uh, and I congratulate the board. Uh, let me just take one second here just to say there was great resumes. We saw the. Uh, you saw the cream of the crop, if I can put it that way, here tonight. Not to say that, that the other 40 to 50 resumes that we reviewed were not good. The majority of them were very good. The majority of them were excellent. It was a tough decision before we even got to the semi semifinal stage. And it was even a tougher decision to get to this stage. And unfortunately for us, it's even a tougher decision getting down to the final candidate because it's, it's, it's uh, as Sean alluded to it, it's, it's going to be very difficult because we've had such great candidates, we had great candidates in front of us tonight. Good so. position for you to be in. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm sure time will prove that correct. Having said that, let me give you this, Mark. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming in. And thank you, gentlemen. Mark, thank you. Mark, likewise, thank you. Again, thank you.
the the uh, interviews for town administrator. As I said, the board will make will contemplate what they've heard, what they've read, what they've seen, and a, a decision will be made by the board. Hopefully next Tuesday night, if the board feels uh, that's the avenue they want to take. Move to adjourn. Any uh, questions before we adjourn? Or I, anyone? I didn't know if there were any from the. No. No. Is it taking a motion? Motion to adjourn at um, eight twenty-five. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you all. Good night, folks. Thanks.